we've got lights, we've got camera, we've got a moderate amount of action. You're scratching your eyeball. I am. I call that action. That's what the people came here for. Eye action. The eyeball scratchings. The audio listeners are like, that's why they come that here? sound like Brian scratching an eyeball? They'd be like, that sound was too loud in the mic. What's up with Brian's <laughs> mic? <laughs> that loud, Don't scratch your elbow, Brian. That loud you cannot eyeball. move or breathe that or loud. touch the mic in any way. You know, I feel like... You know what drives me crazy? I watch other YouTube videos of people using these same microphones mm -hmm. and they're all like <laughs> grabbing them all day long. And I'm just like, why can't I do that? <laughs> I want to be able to just touch the mic without thinking about it and not be freaked out Don't all the time. You've got other things. Other people touching it all the time. I'm like, Fondle this is not a weird bottle. thing that I do. This is very normal. It's a thing that's in your face. You just want to be like, I don't. Uh, I never want to touch my mic. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But it's not just me because there's did, video did, proof. There's video proof of other people that do oh it. Oh my God. Anyway. You just made so many audio noises. Well, um, this is in the pre-roll, so it doesn't Back count. to eyeball scratching though. <laughs> I want to say that I just realized, I think Shannon, my wife Shannon, used to have like a, when she would scratch her eye like this, it would squeak. Really? Yeah, but I think it stopped. I haven't noticed it recently, but I remember used to make, be, I used to make fun of her all the time about her squeaky eyeball. Interesting. I got to talk to her about that. I just realized like, wow, eyeball maybe has been. Just, maybe she's just making that noise with her mouth and trying to fool you. I kind of miss it now. I got to text her, honey, does your That's eyeball weird, still squeak? It's a weird, it's a weird thing to miss. Yeah, it's a weird she, thing to happen. It's a weird thing to miss. Yeah. She's it's unique endearing, and special. It's magical. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Shall we actually start this thing? Let's pencast. We sort of already have. Yeah. Let's pencast. Starting out it's strong. Up. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 89 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about why people talk about larger nibs being better than smaller nibs. Because they cannot lie. The best entry-level stub nibs. Sturb nerbs. Sturb nerbs. How we've maintained our passion for fountain pens over the years. If we have, we'll get into that. Spoiler alert, we haven't. <laughs> we haven't. It's all a facade. Fountain pens suck. We do this purely out of obligation. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the last YouTube videos that we watched, this is interesting. Yeah. Uh, what writing difference that you'll find on a $60 pen versus a $1,000 pen? Like how they actually write. I thought that was a cool question. We may or may not spotlight the Lamy logo. We'll see. We'll see if we get to it. We're starting a bit late on the recording today, but we'll see. Um, if not, we'll do it next time. And we're going to talk about Mother's Day and what went on for the moms in our lives and other things too. So let's kick it off with feedback. Okay. So a bit of a, not a retraction, but a mention from last time. Mm. We read some feedback from Randall who talked about how he was watching the pencast while he was refinishing some yeah. cabinetry and uh, the image didn't get up on there. And oh. I was reminded, hey, oh. where's Randall's basement with the drunken goat mural? So right. I was like, oh my God, I got to put that up. So here it is, Randall's basement watching the pencast with cabinetry in process and the Drunken Animals Around a Table mural. Nice. Which is uh, brilliant, wonderful, and magical, and special. So there you have it. Sorry about that omission. I know that's what you came here for. Very important. And then I got a bit of feedback from my friend Lyra Juno, mm -hmm. who is a makeup artist. Cool. Um, and she commented in regards to our shimmer ink question about whether or not it would come yeah. off, like what to do to keep it from coming off the page. Yeah. And because glitter is very prominent in cosmetics, sure. she's definitely an authority here. So. Sure. Uh, Lyra's comment was pretty robust, so I have her her full comment pinned in the uh, last video, last so if you want to check out the whole thing. But here are the, uh, the high points that I took away. Um, Hi, Brian and Drew, makeup artist here. Glitter will always come off with friction unless sealed with something. Oh. So here are my big takeaways. Okay. Paper texture would most likely have little to no effect on the ability to hold on to the glitter. Okay. Um, because we talked about like maybe a different texture would help. No, nope, yeah. not according it's not really, to it. It's not really absorbing in any way. Apparently not. Okay. Um, you can spray your papers with something like the Sennelier fixative spray okay. or other art sealer, and it would probably prevent the glitter's shimmer from transforming from transferring almost completely. Okay. And a couple other people echoed that saying like there are some, some like- There's like sealing products. Yeah, like some for, art, art Like sealing. mixed media artists and yeah, stuff are using that. Exactly, kind of so apparently that, that could work. Okay. 
Um, and then finally, she mentions the ink will have a natural ability to hold onto the glitter because the particles are so small. Okay. But because I was thinking maybe different inks could add as a, bi yeah, act like, as a binding agent differently. It's like grabbing onto it, yeah, when yeah. it dries. So yeah. she said that's possible. However, <clears throat> even with that, it's not immune to friction. Right, the, the amount of force from the friction is gonna be greater than the binding exactly. of the ink, so, yep. which makes sense. That's why it's not just like flaking off the page as the yep. wind blows. So some inks will have a better yeah. hold, okay. but no matter what, still not immune to friction. That makes sense, because I think about like some pens when you're cleaning them out, like some of them just feel like the ink is like more like stuck in there, yeah. you know, they got more grab to them. Yeah, so essentially okay. friction will always be your enemy when it comes to shimmer inks, mm -hmm. and, if, and it will always come off unless you use some sort of spray uh, sealant. Okay. So there you go. Which is probably not like the most practical thing for no. just like an everyday journal. Yeah. She also mentioned thing. that the glitter component used in ink is very likely a cosmetic glitter just based on the particle size. Because like how any, fine it is? Yeah, yeah. Ba any, any craft glitter wouldn't be quite as fine, so. Oh, it, yeah. it, might, it might be the same sort of stuff. I've used uh, in my own experiments in the past with making my own shimmering ink, um, I've used mica powder, mm -hmm. which is really, really fine. Um, it's probably some version of that. And it's like a non-toxic type of thing. Yeah, I would imagine anything like meant to go on your skin would be fine to get on your hands and in your notebooks and yeah. stuff like that too. So Absolutely. that's probably part of it as yeah, well. Yeah, she says they have to use very special stuff for getting around your eyes because the wrong type of shimmer in an eye Ooh, can lead to- Yeah, because it's like, some of it's like plastic particles, yes, right? you don't but, want that in your eyeball. But mica, mica powder is not plastic, I don't think. I think it's a mineral. I think so. Yeah. So I think like there's definitely different types of shimmer things. Yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, don't, like none of the inks, they say like what they're made of yeah. or it's all kind of proprietary. Yeah. So just, we don't just, really know. Really if you're making your own makeup, don't use craft glitter in it. All right, good to know. All right, and then um, Jessica says, Drew, my fiance and I loved chatting with you at the Chicago Pen Show. As a certified shy person, I 100% endorse- Certified. Certified. I 100% endorse approaching Drew at a pen show. He is just as vibrant, funny, and warm in person as he is on the podcast. That's super nice, and I felt a little weird like putting that on here to read it, but I just, I wanted to illustrate just how nice everybody is and everybody has been. Like, it is yeah. such a delight meeting everybody, and it just, like, words like that are not That's uncommon. Really cool. So, like, that makes me really happy. Like, can you imagine reading that about yourself that somebody who you met once said about you? Like, That's pretty cool. that is amazing. That's cool. Like, ah, oh, golly, that makes me happy. Yeah. Oh, makes me just light up inside. And so it's a certified you. shy person. That's the yeah, like first too. certified shy person I've ever heard of. That's I wonder what, what governing body certifies a yeah. shy person. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. The American Association of probably. Shy People. Probably. You probably have never heard of them. <laughs> well done. And then finally. That was, like, that was uh, kind of a dad joke, Drew. <laughs> that was kind of a dad joke. You just snuck in there. If it's spur of the moment, dad jokes aren't bad. They're only bad when there's like a setup, mm. like a cringy setup. Okay. I like dad jokes when they're natural. Okay, fair there's, enough. There's a time all and place. Right, all right. Uh, and then very finally, picky with your joke. I am. S you, know, you know me and my arbitrary rules, Brian. <laughs> you do have a lot of arbitrary rules. So and one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we talked about some really wild and crazy nibs last week. And uh, Brian mentioned like we would probably never be able to sell any of these. And he's right, but- I stand by that. You know- <laughs> Probably uh, never. Yeah, probably oh, never. Yeah. Not like I, would, not, we're not like opposed to doing it. Right. It's just not to expect that that is a likelihood. Right, but we are curious. Um, like theoretically, if a gold Yovo compatible nib that was stacked, you know, portion of like the a nib, number six nib, yeah, number six, probably. that was stacked. What one bit of a nib welded onto the other part of the nib that gives you, you know, a fine line, you know, written like this, a very very thick line written like this, and maybe a different line when it's upside down. Sorry, audio listeners, you're not. My hand is doing weird things. You're painting a picture with words. Theoretically, here, I if, feel if like the, I can see it in my mind. If there eye. were a stacked nib available for six hundred dollars or thereabouts in the neighborhood, like would anybody actually be willing to pay that? I'm curious. I mean, they, they are out there. I just don't know if mm -hmm. we have anybody. So please, just let me know in the comments if you're like, actually, yeah, I've just been waiting for the right opportunity. If so, you are a certified shy person and would be afraid to just proactively reach out about that. You know, we're inviting you to do so. There we go. Yes. So yeah, I'm just out of curiosity. Yeah. But I'll say in the meantime, like. Obviously, any product that we carry, we're 
there's overhead, there's logistics and stuff involved in that. It may or may not make sense, especially for like craft items, like like yeah. handmade craft items like this. It just may not make sense, even if there is some interest. But by all means, like we already heard of one one of the people we mentioned last week who got reached out to mm-hmm. about one of their nibs directly, mm-hmm. just from the interest that came from the pink ass. And I was like, well, that's awesome. We're not like gonna personally, like immediately financially benefit from that, but I don't, I don't really care about that. It's like cool to recognize people in yeah. the community and spread the love and all that. So. By all means, like anybody that we've mentioned here, like reach out to them directly if you are interested. Don't wait for us to carry or not carry something. Yeah. Just reach out to them. And then if they are if they get flooded with interest and they're like, I can't handle all this, can I just sell through you guys? And we'll be like, oh, okay, cool. We'll just talk about that. Yeah. So, so all yeah. that information is on last week's Pencast episode 88. There you go. So what are you, what about you? Uh, well, I do need to recognize this is the last episode in the 80s, Drew. We're uh, leaving the 80s going into the 90s. Well, here's the thing. So we'll need to grab here's a the thing. fanny pack the and 80s, some neon the 80s, and slap bracelets. The 80s transcended the 90s a little bit. There was an overlap. Because like a 81 a still bleed. very much feels like the 70s. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, wasn't bet- it wasn't until between like 83 and 84 that the 80s vibe truly kicked in. Sure. And I feel like that's a little bit in, in the case with the 90s. Like 92 still very much f- felt like the 80s. Yeah, there's so, a there's a I think once you pass ninety two though, you're it's fine. not like it's you're not like once the number changes, everybody in the world is yeah. like all my interests are different right. now. So I'm comfortable <laughs> uh, when we when we pass episode ninety two, I'll I'll feel like the eighties are truly okay. gone. Do you feel like the nineties really arrived when like grunge started to take effect? Yeah, and like, and the, fl- like flannel and, and grunge. the trapper keeper. Trapper keeper Trapper Keeper was like, you Lisa know, Lisa Frank was 90, big. 92, 93. So yeah, that that's the Trapper remember, Keeper was very Starter 90s. Starter Jackets. Yep, that was like 93, 94, I believe, somewhere uh-huh. around there. You had what, Air Jordans? Those were big. Pumps. Pumps. The 90s. The Bulls. Chicago Bulls were big. That Bulls, was the 90s. Hornets, yeah. Magic. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sports sports games. All the sports games. Yeah, lots of sports happening. Also, the Olympics were bigger in the 90s than they are now, I feel like. I wonder if that's true. I mean, you had the... Figure skating at least was. For whatever reason, in the 90s, everybody knew who figure, figure skaters skating, were. Yeah, we like, had what like happened? Nancy like, Kerrigan. Christy Yamaguchi. All that, yeah. Uh, Brian Boitano. Uh, um, this is just because that's when we became aware of yeah, them as but, kids. Yeah, but I couldn't name any, not since then, could I name a single figure skater? Because you're not Scott your, Hamilton. You're not in your former years anymore. Why do I know him? Anymore. Well, he's like a, he's a broadcaster now for the Olympics. He's I had no of, idea. Yeah, you've seen him. He's around. No, I have not. I, yeah, I, have, not, I have not watched the Olympics for probably Ever. Not since elementary school. I definitely don't keep up with it as much yeah. as I had in the past. Anyway, feedback. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that what we're doing? Okay. Um, let's start out with Margalo399. When Brian said, long story short, I confess I dropped my knitting. Gotta love you, Brian. <laughs> do I, I can't do that, do it, can I? Long story shorts. You can try. That's not what I do. You can try. It's, That's you, like whenever, whenever Drew and I are about to start recording the pencast, we're like, all right, let's try to keep it short this time. Never happens. It's you like have a good joke intentions. Now. I always have good intentions, but yep. Oh, well, not a gift of mine. Uh, all right, Jan Math, I, I, I can't even pronounce this one. Jan. Jan, Jan Math. Uh, may I politely note why infinitely repeating one second time travel is not possible with Doc Brown's time machine? This is in response to your do. hypothetical. With my last zero time. research involved um, hypothetical that I did last week. Oh, also someone wrote in because I said that I was unsure if the time machine had a seconds counter. Okay. Someone confirmed that it does not. It is just to the minute. Well, then there's no way you're going to end up on planet Earth if you can't calculate it I, to I, the like microsecond, I nanosecond. Disagree. I don't disagree. There's holes. There's major holes. Anyway. Um, okay. But if you missed last week, the whole thing was like in because it was episode 88. That's the speed at which the DeLorean got up to to time travel and back to the future. Well, my theory was if you time traveled back to one second before you time traveled, would you create an infinite loop because you would just be time traveling back to when you started time traveling and not have any time to change that trajectory. All right, so uh, Jan Math here is going to poke holes in my theory. Okay, so you have to refill energy carriers after each time travel. Interesting. So you'd basically run out of fuel. That's why he got stuck in 1955, because he didn't have any plutonium. Interesting. You need now pl- that I think you need about a, you need a, a nuclear okay. reaction to generate the 1.21 gigawatt, gigawatts, gigawatts of electricity. Okay. That's why they needed to hook the clock tower up okay. and use the bolt of lightning. So episode one, plutonium, episode two to three is waste. Okay. If Mr. Do- Fusion, a beer can, do- <laughs> uh, banana peel. I don't think I've seen this since I was yeah. probably 10. So... Um, if Doc succeeds in inventing an automatic waste refilling system, there would still be this problem. 
Okay, number two, even if the DeLorean had a full tank, 13 and a half liquid gallons, gosh, this is so much more <laughs> detail than I knew was even uh, asking. Uh, with an estimated consumption of eight miles per gallon, the tank would be empty after 6,000 seconds, an hour and 40 minutes at the latest. Okay. So, so it still runs on fuel. It but still the, runs on fuel. So the time circuits, the flux capacitor runs on the plutonium or the Mr. Fusion reactor. So you, you wouldn't create an infinite loop. You would create a loop, but it would run out because you'd run out of fuel. Well, e that's, that's even if there was a recurring generated fusion system, which there is not. Mr. Is it like a one-shot use? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. so if you if you time travel to one second prior, you would you're gone. You would yep. just you would just use your fuel and that's yep. it. Yeah, the car would still run. Okay. Like you know the actual DeLorean itself. Oh, but would the still time travel around. aspect wouldn't work. Yeah, interesting. All right, there you go. Thank you for correcting the logic of something that's impossible <laughs> to happen anyway. But, all right, I love good, that. Good. That's this is our crowd. This is our crowd. My I appreciate. People. I appreciate. I appreciate that. Yes. I will never ask another question about <laughs> Back to the Future because I will get schooled every day. Um, and then uh, one other thing from MSY Mac, would you guys consider selling mugs? I saw a picture of one the other day and I'd love one. We have sold mugs in the past. We have, we sold them through a third party store. We got them through a third party store. Mm -hmm. We like bought them in bulk. We've done both. We've sold them in house and through and a third we've done, party. Yeah, and we've done like. Um, um, and they, they were, they started off popular and then just kind of like faded. The, the and the popularity then, died off quite a bit. Yeah. And they were, they were pretty expensive as mugs go. I think they were like 20 bucks or something like that. Yeah, we would try to like buy them when there was like a Black Friday sale or something, yeah. we'd buy a ton of them and then try to sell them at like an okay price. Mm -hmm. It still felt a bit on the pricey side. Yeah. But also we don't ship a lot of mugs. It's not like our process is not really designed around shipping mugs. Yeah, they were like in, you know, big square boxes. So, so. yeah, it was, it was kind of like a break even proposition for us. So that's why we went the like third party route, which there's a lot of that around, you know, what it's like Zazzle does that and what are the, t what the, Teespring and like those yeah. types of things. But you know, I don't know. Could I mean we could certainly set something up through a third party thing. And yeah. you would be end up paying like kind of a premium, but then if you really wanted it, you could get it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, we're open to that. We can think about it. Like again, if if there's if the interest is there, anymore, then like, we did Teespring for a while. Like No, we killed yeah, Teespring. We did. We brought all of our stickers in house. Yeah, because I think I think we used to have mugs on there. You had to pay. But, you had to pay per shipping. You had to pay a shipping thing for each for item each you added. Item. It was crazy. That was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just really expensive. So we we could consider doing like you know we haven't maybe looked at that in a while though. So no, it's we could revisit. If, if, if the interest is there, we could consider like a single batch or something. You know, but then, again, let us know. Um, we're here for we're you. So it. yeah. If to, if to answer the question, we would consider it. Yes. I'm not going to say for sure we're going to do it, but we're open to it. Yeah. Thank you for the prompt. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's talk about a very few new things that we have. All right. Oh, I got all the new stuff this week, Drew. Well, all, Look e at this. Every single this one. This vast amount of one thing. Every um, single one. We're in a bit of a dry spell at the moment. We got a lot of, a lot of new stuff that's We had some stuff that, that could have come today. I mean, it could, could have come this week, but it didn't. But it, yeah. So Just there's, there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Yeah, shipping delays, we'll whatnot. Yeah. Um, the one thing that we do have to talk about is a Pelican M800 Green Demo Limited Edition. And... This is a very green pen. It's a very lovely pen. Green and gold. Mm. I mean, Pelican knows their greens. It's but this lovely. is like a it's like a brighter green than the typical Pelican I green. Because so. a typical Pelican green is more like a like a Sherwood green, like a darker one. This is a very vibrant, like a green, like a meadow like green. A Kelly green almost. Kelly yeah. green. Yeah, it's like a yellowish. It's got a lot of yellow to it. Um, but very, very demonstratory. I would say like, I don't know, if you had to guess the opacity, I would say like 80%. Like twenty percent opacity. Yeah, it's like, like very... there's the green ink window that Pelican has had before. It's yeah. much lighter than that. Right. Like that green ink window is pretty it's dark. It's pretty dark. Like you can barely tell that yeah. there's this is, something yeah, going this on. Yeah, this is not there. that type of green. Yeah, you'll but see. You'll, it is... you'll see. Yeah, we've got yeah. pictures. You're yeah. probably looking at it right now. Um, gorgeous looking pen though. If you're into green, green is very finicky. I get that. It's not going to be everybody's green. But for those that like this shade of green. It's very few pens that are out there like this, especially yep. with like this fit and finish and build quality. Pelican makes great stuff. And I personally, I like the M800. That's like a great all around size for me. I have slightly I bigger hands. I agree. I notice a big difference in weight because the mechanism on the M800 
is mostly metal as opposed to mostly plastic on the M600. Yeah. So there's a, it's not just the pen itself is bigger, but it feels heavier. Like mm -hmm. it feels heftier than an M600. I like the 800 as yeah. well. Yeah. Rachel likes the M600 more. I, I, you know, we'll get into this later, but I like the bigger nib. I think that, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't need, like the 1000 is fun, but that's, it's so much. The 1000 is, it's a lot. It's a bit much. The it's 800 is like, it, it and the and Pelican has such an ornate in nib imprint. They got a great and looking nib. On the 800, I feel like that just, oh. It I mean, just, it looks good on the 600 too. Like they have a great look, they have a great looking does, nib design on all their Subarons. They also have a kind of a narrow nib. So it's I, definitely, you notice a big difference in the width on, yeah. between the six and eight, like yeah. the, between the four and 600, not as much of a difference. Yeah. If it even is a difference, is it a difference? I can't remember. Do they use the same nibs on those two? I think it's the two and 400 yeah. are the same size. It's just the 400 is gold, right? Mm. And I think the 600 is slightly larger than the 400. Sure. And then the 800 and then the 1000. I, don't know. I we, think they're we, all different sizes except for the two and the 400. Yeah, we actually, not we don't carry a lot of Pelicans, so it's harder for me to keep. We've carried them in the updated. past. We carry a lot of special editions. Yeah. And like I've got a bunch in my collection, but again, we're not using them like all the time and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, but we've got the green demo right now M800. It's $704. So it is. It's up there. An investment, but extra fine through broad nib. Their nibs are great though. Um, yeah. Their extra fines though, they're very wet, I will say. Pelican is like one of the wettest extra fines out there. So if you're used to Japanese extra fines, you're not even gonna get anything close to that. You're yeah, gonna need gonna to get a custom ground, but um, they do write very smooth though. And a little bouncy too. It's another thing I like about the M800. I feel like it's bouncier. Yeah. Um, and then basically we have a bunch of other random stuff that's coming soonish. Mm -hmm. Next we couple exact weeks. Exact dates for many of these things. But we just wanted to highlight our coming soon page. Yeah. Because we have all kinds of stuff. You can sign up for email lists to be notified as soon as we do put any of these things back in stock. We've got a new Banu exclusive that's going to yeah, be coming we do. out. That looks really good. We've got a bunch of Lloydstern planners and all kinds of other random like inks and stuff like that that are on the on the horizon. Yeah. We've got a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So always check out the coming soon page. We've got some mm -hmm. stuff on there that's not even coming out for a couple months. So you could see some yeah. stuff well in that's advance true. as well. And sometimes stuff comes earlier than mm -hmm. what we expect. Usually I feel like stuff gets pushed out and comes later, but we try to keep it somewhat accurate as to what we know. Um, but yeah, go check it out. And that's all the new stuff we got. So let's move on to Q and A. Hey! All right, teased it a little bit before, but we're gonna talk about Nibbage. Yes. So Margallo 399, wait a second, did we just listen to? We did. Margallo399 is hey. the long story short person. Nice. How about that? A YouTube comment and Very an Instagram. active commenter. Yeah. And they've got the same name on both platforms. How about that? Anyway, Margallo is coming back to us. Consistency. Asking you, Brian, why are larger nibs, number six, number eight, touted as a positive? I, Margallo399, vastly prefer mm. number five nibs. Um, what is the deal <clears throat> with obje big nibs? Obje <laughs> objectively, um, I think it's kind of hard to say that they're inherently better. I think there tend to be some attributes of larger nibs that most people find more desirable, but it is not necessarily always the case that they are such a, such a way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> why are they touted as a positive? Um, why, why do you think people view larger nibs as an added bonus? Like, hey, here's like what we were saying about the Pelican. Like, right, oh, the 800 right. has a bigger, noticeably bigger nib. I think it, to me, I think, I, I think there are, I'll get into this a little bit. There are some kind of objective things that could be different on a larger nib. Does that actually make it better though? I think largely it's all about our personal preference. It's not necessarily that like larger nibs make the ink do anything different or feel necessarily different. I think a lot of it is personal preference. Even what like some of the scientific objective things that make them different still at the end of the day boil down to personal preference as to even mattering what those differences are. Um, so I think if you prefer number five nibs, good on you. Use them to your heart's delight and just live your best life. Like there's no... You don't need to feel bad that you don't prefer number six nibs. Like I think it's more just that more people tend to just like 
it's kind of like the weight of pens. Like, or, or I was thinking slimness. Like slim, yeah, slim pens. Some people love them, but there's not yeah. a lot of them because most people don't. Right. Yeah. Or like, uh, you know, cl clipless pens. Yeah. Or you know, like pocket pens or lanyard pens or what. You know, it's like it's not inherently better or worse. It's just more people tend to prefer or, or hooded nibs or whatever. Um, the hooded nibs. Maybe I shouldn't have brought that up because those have some other attributes. But anyway. Um, also, do larger nibs. Most are person. Well, yeah. Yeah. We'll get into that. Okay, so um, I would say with steel nibs, it probably makes not that much of a difference, the overall size of the nib. The biggest difference that I think larger nibs tend to make, especially in gold nib form, is you essentially have more leverage. Like the longer your nib, then the more opportunity there is for the tines to kind of flex out a little bit and yeah. for it to feel a little, a, a little bit bouncier. Yeah. You don't, uh, that that there is that leverage aspect to a steel nib, but because steel is not a very flexible material to begin with, I don't think it's a noticeable difference, the bounciness of a number six or a number eight steel nib versus a number five or a number four or something like that. I think if you're really trying to mash it down, maybe you can tell a difference, but in everyday writing, I don't think you really notice a difference. So I think a lot of it comes down to aesthetics. It's just a larger nib. It's just a larger canvas for whatever design is on top of the nib maybe just your own sense of balance of the aesthetics of the pen like in terms of the proportion of the nib to the pen body yeah like you know how those some, but that's some of those large tachias have the sure. bigger nib it does look or i'm thinking like the ian shown pens mm -hmm. with like a number six with like a pocket pen you know it's like proportionally that's one of the bigger nib to pen ratios that yeah. you'll get right does that mean it writes any better or different? Like, no, not really. Um, I think that that with gold nibs, you you do tend to notice a little bit more. We were just talking about the Pelican pens, right? So with Pelicans, like when you get to the 800, 1000 nibs, those are noticeably bouncier and you do get a pretty significantly different feel to the way the nibs write as you go up in size on those Pelican pens because they're gold nibs and because the nibs are larger. Is that the only factor? I'm not 100% sure. Like, I don't know if the metal is thinner or they've, whatever, the wing shape is different or something like that that contributes to the bounciness of it. But I think just all else equal, the bigger, the longer the nib um, on a gold material, it's gonna be it's gonna be a little bouncier, a little softer. So I think that is, but again, that's also a personal preference thing. Not everybody likes that. Some people like really stiff nibs. So it comes down to like, what is your preference and does it happen to line up with kind of where most people are? Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily have to, it's not objectively better. I tend to like larger nibs more personally. I think that a lot of people tend to fall into that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, yeah, more room for nib designs, kind of like as a canvas. Um, I think we just find that number six just tends to be more popular. And when I think about this, I think about Banu. When we first picked up Banu, they had a lot of pens that had number five nibs on them. And those pens especially are generally on the bigger side, right? There's a lot going on in the material. It just shows off better in like the facets and stuff like that. So those are bigger. Those probably were more of like a sense of like aesthetic balance. Like I feel like the smaller nibs just looked really small on some of those pen models. I agree. And they, you know, kind of took notice of the preferences mm -hmm. that most folks had for the larger nibs. And so they've, I mean, I, th I think they still offer some pens with number five nibs, but I think as a whole, they're focusing a lot more on pens with number six nibs and the pens are selling better. So, you know, is it just the nibs alone that make that? Because they've, you know, kind of come up with different models and colors and stuff. So it's like, I don't really know, but definitely we're selling more Banu now with number six nibs on them than we ever did by with bar. number five. And that's, that's a trend that we've noticed across most of our brands. Like we've sold plenty of Edison pens in the past number six nibs wipe the floor with every model we've ever done with a number five. And that's just a preference thing that most people have. So, um, yeah. And I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I, I guess I would say number six is probably a more popular like size overall, like in the industry. So I don't know if there's like economies of scale or something like that, that come into play from like the manufacturing perspective, or it's just like, you know, more of them are made because that's what more people tend to buy. I don't think it's really that they're any better or worse or whatever. But I mean, Twisby's, they, the 580 and all that, that 580 is a number five. The Vaxxon 100 is a number six, but the 580, five, yeah, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. They're slightly different shape, but they're about that size. Yeah. I mean, the, the Vaxxon 100 doesn't outsell 
the 580, like the 580 way outsells the back 700. Certainly. I mean, it's a bigger, so it's like, there's a good example. And the Twisby Eco is a number four nib and that's every bit as popular, if not more popular than the 580. So it's not like a universal rule. I think it's just a more of an observation of what most people tend to be into. For kind sure. Like you, right? Like you're into the larger nibs. Uh, yes, but part. I am into the larger nibs because historically they've performed better for me. Really? They have. How so? Um, I think about the Yobo number fives I've had. Hmm. I remember when Karis Customs offered the Fountain K and the ink. The ink always outperformed hmm. the Fountain K um, with that number six nib. Uh, I think of the um, Twisby's an exception for sure. All of their mm -hmm. nibs write mm -hmm. great. But uh, I think about the um, steel nibs from uh, Visconti as well. Um, their smaller mm. nibs tended to be less consistent for me anyway. Interesting. Than their mm. larger steel nibs did. But there's so. nothing inherently about a pen or there's nothing inherently about a nib being slightly smaller. Nope. So again, this could be like a correlation, maybe not causation or something like that. It might but, be that there's just more of a an industry standard that has number six nibs more dialed in in terms of performance. Huh. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But I will say that for, from an experiential standpoint, I've found that number six nibs perform more consistently perform for better. me. Interesting. Yeah. I'm curious what y'all think out there in Pencast listening slash watching land. Do you all tend to find that there is not just what your personal preferences are, but do you find there's actually a performance difference between more of your pens that have the number six larger nibs and smaller nibs? I feel like I've run into more tight tines on number that five nibs. That I don't know be. why. That I could be, but there's nothing There's nothing about the nib being smaller that should cause that. I'm not saying that that may or may not be the case, especially with certain like brands or manufacturers. Maybe it's just they don't make as many of them, so they don't focus on it as much. Or you know, I, it don't, might I don't know. be that the num the smaller nibs are a little bit more rigid. Uh, you think which, so? Which could in terms no, of like I, I have no idea. It, but it's not that much smaller. No, it's you not. Know what I mean? But, but like, if it is smaller, you know, you are your leverage is going to be different. So hmm. um, perhaps this, you know, if, if, if there is a spacing See, issue, it might be a little less forgiving. I'm talking about that. I think about like a Lamy 2000 or a Pilot Vanishing Point. Those nibs are tiny. Yeah, but those are gold. That's true. That's true. They are gold. So maybe there's something to that. I don't or know. They spend more time on those nibs. I don't know. I don't know. It is curious. I'd, I would like to hear some other it opinions. Is curious. There shouldn't be a reason why they would perform best. I agree. But it might be something that just tends to be observable. I, I don't think know. Th I think that might be it. But yeah, curious. I, there shouldn't be a reason. <laughs> well, Interesting. Maybe there okay. is a reason. We just don't know about it. Okay. Well, classic pencast. We've raised more <laughs> questions than given you answers. <laughs> And told you that it depends. So there you're you go. welcome. You're welcome. Oh, thanks for being Much patient clearer. with us. All right, Drew, I got a nice uh, question for you. A couple of questions, actually. Lay it on me. All right, should I hit them both yep. up front? Or Double whammy. Wanna... Okay. All right. First one is from RJ773. Best entry level stub nibs. Mm, stub nerb. All right. And Jake Wealth says, or Jake W. Heath, Jake Weath. Sorry. <laughs> I put the L in there. It wasn't there. Sorry, Jake. I'm not trying to make you wealthy. Um, best, though you may be. I don't know. You don't need more of my tangents. <laughs> what are you doing? What, what am I even talking about? <laughs> am I asking a question? All right. So I feel like I need to recap now. Best <laughs> entry-level stub nibs, yeah. in case you forgot the first question. And then second one is best pens for 1.5 Goulet stub nibs. Got to keep up with that ink demand. So it's all about stubs. Yes. Okay. Okay. You get, um, you get it. Let me... Uh... <laughs> You Let me it. ask. Did you get what you needed through through my yes smorgasbord of words? Let me answer uh, Jake, Jake, Jake Wealth's Jake, question Jake, first. Jake, Jake Weath. <laughs> All right, Jake. Um, I would definitely go with something. So if you're looking to uh, have a good pen that goes with the Goulet number five, I would definitely go with something that originally has a Yovo nib on it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like our Goulet nibs, it's I think the safest that, um, bet. Yeah. yeah. So like our Goulet nibs, I think they're, Yovo makes great nibs that are easily swappable between different pens. And a lot of pens do, uh, are compatible with a number six standard nib. However, you know, they do vary a little bit here and a little bit there. And I've found performance wise, if you put a number six Yovo onto 
a pen that originally had a number six Yovo that still has that Yovo-ish feed and housing unit, you you do run into fewer variables. And mm -hmm. even swapping nibs at all, you're gonna have some variables because you know, this is a controlled leak and even the slightest difference can make something, you know, feel a little wonky. So that's definitely a best bet uh, or something like Edison or Franklin Kristoff that already, you know, has been manufactured with the Yovo feed in mind, I think is your best bet. Um, that being said, Jake, um, uh, if you wanted to take it a step further, now this is not an affiliation, um, but I've mentioned them before, but the Flexible Nib Factory website, actually has an ebonite yovo compatible feed and housing unit hey that if you wanted to make sure that flow was very much able to keep up with the 1.5 nib that's a great bet they're only like 20 bucks Ebonite um, is the bomb it is the, the, this this guy only has like four of them on his website so <laughs> you know it's going to be limited but uh not anymore we've we me you mentioned it we've mentioned before <laughs> and he hasn't complained but Good. and honestly the picture of uh, his his yovo um the image on the website of his Yovo Ebonite housing has a Goulet nib in it. Hey, so, um, there that's you go. awesome. Uh, so that that's an that's an option. It is again unaffiliated. Definitely a third party hack situation. Yeah. But it they work. I have one myself. Not this particular one, but I can say that he makes good stuff. Cool. Um, and then um, going one step further, um, my next answer for both uh, Jake and um, RJ here. Uh, would be that uh, while I do like the Yovo uh, stub nibs, Goulet, Edison, whatever, uh, I will say I personally enjoy the writing experience of the Lamy 1.5 stub more. Um, really? I, I found that the Lamy feed, for whatever reason, get out tends I'm to... <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, bye-bye. The Lamy feed, for Blast whatever humor. reason, seems to keep up with the 1.5 stroke better than I found the Yovo uh, uh, huh. feeds too. So personally, that's just been my experience. I love my Lamy 1.5 nib. I really do. Um, and for a new user to stubs, that's a great option because the Lamy nibs are easily swappable. They're the most affordable spare nibs you can buy. Hmm. And then um, if, you, yeah, if you don't fall in love with it, you can just take it off and swap it out with a new one very mm -hmm. easily. Plus like, I think a, a 1.5 is one that like, probably won't be the best like everyday nib for most people. No. So I like that as like a, an easily swappable option because yeah. it's the kind of thing that like, if you want to write a fancy letter. Or if you want to fill up a page quickly. Yeah, you can space. Th throw that thing on yeah. there, but you're probably not going to want to like carry or like buy a special pen dedicated to a 1.5 necessarily. So that's why the Lamy nibs are great for that. For sure. And I'll also say that um, two more I think are good for new stub users. One being the Pilot Parallel. The Parallel is a favorite mm. of mine because I think that it is a great training vehicle. Mm. Because as you know, Brian, you know anybody who has written with a Pilot Parallel knows that if you if you rotate your hand in any way, that thing's going to stop writing. Mm -hmm. You have to have that you know paddle shaped nib firmly mm -hmm. and perfectly on the page to get a nice, even, consistent stroke. So it's great at training you to avoid, you know, wrist movement, which even after, you know, a decade plus of writing with pens, I still find myself doing. I got a mm -hmm. nib worked on by um, the nib tailor over at Chicago Pen Show, um, JC. And he said very politely, so do you always uh, hold your pen like that? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, of course I do. But then realized I had been, I was rotating, and um, oh. I I I am usually conscious of what it. A but polite he, way to phrase that. He was very polite. Instead yes. Of like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yes. No. He was very polite. Um, but it reminded me that like, no matter how long you've been writing, you can absolutely be you know susceptible to rotation, and mm. it is good to make sure that if you're writing with a stub nib, you have that nice, firm, immovable grip so that you get a consistent stroke, mm. and um, you know you don't get any scratchiness. So the parallel is great for that. And then the Sailor High Ace Neo um, mm. is also a great choice. It's a really affordable, um, is less uh, cumbersome than a Pilot Parallel. You can fit it in a standard pen case, I mean. And it's like uh, three inches shorter. I'm just kidding. Like, right. It feels like it. Yeah, Pilot Parallel is <laughs> ginormous. Um, so it's not as awkward as the Parallel and does come in a multitude of nib sizes and uh, is it writes very nicely. I love mm -hmm. that pen. I think it's a pretty underrated pen, actually. It is. Yeah, it's a good one. So those are my choices, uh, Lamy and then Parallel and Hi-Ace Neo.
Yeah. But of course, you know, the Goulet 1.5 is great too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, stick with an Edison or Franklin Kristoff or some other, you know, Carolina pen company, whatever, you know, if you have a uh, hand turned um, mm -hmm. uh, acrylic pen, those will fit just fine as well because they're usually, most often, that's what pen turners use. They use Yobo stuff. Yeah. So you're probably yeah. safe with one of those. Yeah. I agree with all of that. Um, I'll add in there the other pilot stub nibs. Not a 1.5, but I like the ones, so the, the Plumix is not as much of a thing anymore. There are some metros that have these nibs on them, but the Pilot 1.0 stub is great. They're on a couple of different pens. The Metropolitan is one of them. Um, I really like the way those write. And those to me are good for just kind of starting out with stubs because they're not as drastic as a 1.5 and you can kind of fit them in like a normal seven or eight millimeter ruling so it's a little more of an everyday nib that you can kind of write with it's a good point. like a 1.5 or a 1.1 you know lamy 1.1 is a good starter nib too any lamy with oh, my first a nib. starter nib yeah is really good too um those are all good the sale heist neo you got that one covered um twisby's nibs are pretty good too so um you can get those on the eco swipe the go there's lots of different ones um those are all very good and very affordable pens as well. Um, as far as the GPC nibs, so I will say like when we started carrying those nibs, we had a lot more pens that benefited from, you know, swapping out uh, pens like Noodler's pens and a lot of more Jin Howes and stuff like that. Over the years, there are kind of fewer of those pens that we've, are like more easily swappable. We've pared down our offerings of those brands and we've also, yeah. uh, the, they've, They've become less compatible. Yeah, especially the Noodlers ones are less compatible. Yeah. I honestly haven't played with them in a little bit. Like Neither on the newer I. versions. I can't remember the last time I used one of those. But I remember like in the early days, we even did some like heat setting videos and stuff like that, um, you know, for t for replacing different nibs and and because they have Ebonite feeds as well. Um, so they were good for that, but the Noodlers pens only came with flex nibs. So it like made sense to have non-flex nib options. Um, but over the years, they got redesigned to be less swap compatible, I guess. Yeah. So just so it's more like more out of the box writing, not need to heat set, that kind of a thing. So I think it still can be done, but it may require some like tweaking modifications, stuff like that. So it's a little less of like a easy to recommend as a first thing. Yeah. Um, though there are some still gin Hals that are pretty easy to swap. And the gin Hals, like the nibs are okay, but most of them are like only medium or only fine. So it's good to have other nib size options. Um, and the pens themselves are so affordable. Like, yes, you're basically paying more for the nib than you are for the pen, but yeah then you're getting a better experience, but there just aren't as many of them as we used to have. So, you know, there are definitely like, we still have our Goulet nibs and we're gonna keep offering them as long as people want them, but it's like less of a clear, like, oh yeah, this is amazing. Like options is getting you there. There are a lot of other pens that have, you know, pretty good nibs on them already. Um, so it's just more for like having having more options. Yeah, and also to replace damaged ones. Yeah, that, exactly. So you don't have to replace a whole new pen. Yeah, good point. All right. All right. Next. Next up, we've got one from uh, Scohow. Sure. Sure. Um, Brian and Drew, hmm. how have you maintained your passion for fountain pens, ink, and the accoutrements thereof? Hmm. The passion can't be missed, so I'm wondering what keeps you excited, both as business owners slash management <clears throat> and users. Hmm. Medium time lo uh, li medium time listener, hey first now. time caller here. <laughs> By the way, love what you do. Mm, interesting. All right. Do we still like fountain pens, Brian? Actually, someone this is asked a rather us, assumptive question. Someone asked us. Someone asked us in the lightning round last week if we like fountain pens, and we said yes. I said yes. So we can't pretend like we didn't expound. I guess we wetted Schoolhouse palette here. We can't. We can't. We can't lie and say we don't like fountain pens because we fessed up that we did last week. So true. We did tip our. All hands. right. We, we do. We do. We still like them. Yeah. Um, How do you maintain your passion, Brian? You know, I'd like to I'd like to say that I like do something like I don't I don't really do anything intentional to maintain the passion. It just kind of is there. Mm. You know, I'm I consider myself pretty fortunate in that respect. Um for me, I think there's still the like getting my hands on a pen, playing with it. It's just kind of still always fun, which is really cool after doing this for so many years. Um what is also fun and and deepens my passion and appreciation in this weird wonderful world that we're in is learning 
even more about like the history of the pens and the history of the companies behind the pens, the countries that they came from and the stories of the founders and the people that work there now and how the cultural influences certain aspects of the design. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of really cool backstory and there's passion that runs throughout the whole industry. It's not just mass manufactured, you know, pumped out products to maximize, you know, return for investors, you know, sell maximum number of widgets for the least number of, you know, cost or whatever. It's, it's really a passion driven industry. And pretty much everybody that we see who's involved is doing it because they love it. It's for some reason at some level. Um, so that's pretty cool. And that's pretty inspiring. And that definitely helps, you know, because as in any job or career or whatever, there's plenty of just, you know, overhead and logistics and just politics and BS that you have to deal with, with filing taxes and doing, you know, reports on accounting and like stuff that's just like, not really the reason why you get into business uh, or, <laughs> or the reason why, you know, you love, you love pens and you're like, I'm staring at spreadsheets and I'm, you know, dealing with things that have nothing to do with actual pens. Um, there's, plenty of that that happens the deeper that you you know that you go into running a business um but for me like seeing that passion run through at all levels of the business even despite all that like just kind of boring adulty stuff is is it's still really fun i feel like i get to be you know kind of that newbie playing with pens again and not having to think about like the real work part of it um there's definitely like tech ta 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 technical aspects of the pens that are interesting, you know, as we've carried more and more pens and gotten into different materials and filling mechanisms and gotten to tour factories and seeing like how they're made and designed and just gotten our hands on a bunch of them. I just appreciate so much more of what goes into making them and all different types. And so there's like really nerdy aspects of like the technical aspects of the pen that are always uh, something to get excited about. Uh, also, just the enthusiasm of those who are in the hobby, our customers. You just went to the Chicago show. Anytime we get to see pen people in real life, we're just like, wow, this is so special. This it's, is so cool. It's magical. It's really, it it's really, really amazing. That is like a life-giving aspect of all this for us. Like, I, I like just in the YouTube comment section from last week, Yeah, somebody said something and then someone said, Oh, I got to meet you in San Francisco last year. I I told you about this, or I gave you this thing, and they're like, "Oh yeah, hi, how you doing?" Like right. in the YouTube comment section, like crazy. Our our YouTube comment section That's is so just great. a little oasis of happiness and kindness, and it just it's amazing. Like, how could you not get passionate about that? Like, it's it's pretty hard to ignore. The community just keeps everything just alive and vibrant in such an amazing and unique way. Well, and that honestly was the initial thing that stood out to me when I was, I was making pens by hand, ballpoints and roller balls and stuff like that back before I saw the light, um, you know, and that whole like community and passion aspect was exactly what was missing. There was nobody was really into it. They were buying pens for gifts or to get, you know, something they were needed some novelty of it, but they weren't passionate about the pens themselves. But as soon as I discovered the fountain pen community, specifically going to the DC show for the first time and getting to see real pen people in person. I was like, what is this all about? Because people were walking around with pens, like sticking out of their like fishing vests. And, you know, they were just pens, just as far as the eye could see and like the ballrooms and stuff. And I was like, okay, there's something here. I don't really know is. what this is all about. And, and yet 15 <laughs> years later, even through it, the, the community's introduction to internet communities uh everything's still super positive yeah like it, it's something that the community chooses yeah. to protect yeah everybody knows that they have something special here and when anything overly negative or hateful comes into it it is it's, very quickly it sticks out and you're like it is it is, is like that? it's like it's like here? the community <laughs> says you don't belong here yeah um that that's not the place for this and yeah. I, I like it's awesome today like that is just so important and beautiful yeah it's also crazy because like i'll go to a so i'll go to a pen show and i'll just like walk by one table and there's somebody's got they got pens just covering their whole table of like one particular brand or like some vintage thing and i'm like this person knows more about these pens than i ever could and it's like 
everybody in the room is like that deep in some area of this whole thing. I'm like, there is so much to get into in this hobby that there's a whole lifetime that any more than several lifetimes that you could get into and still be discovering new stuff. So that's always really cool for me. Um, new stuff is fun, new products. We love getting to play with new products and get excited when y'all get excited about new stuff. Um, and just having a hand in uh, helping to develop new stuff too, getting to do exclusives and working with manufacturers to be like, hey, what if we did a pen that was like, a lot of people would like this or they have some material and we're like, oh, could we put that on this pen? What if we put sprinkles in a pen? Right, that would be amazing. What if we did one that looked like coffee? And it's like, oh, everyone wants that, that's cool. So that's really exciting too, after being in this for a long time. You know, there's definitely aspects of it that's like, oh, okay, yep, another pen, you know, here we go. But a lot of pens were still like, oh, this is novel. This is really cool. So getting to be like more on the front end of that. Um, and I would say just for myself personally, as the owner and founder, you know, as the company's grown, I'm spending more of my time in planning and reading and meetings and being on the computer and having basically nothing to actually do with pens. It's just part of running a business, part of leading a team of 30 people. You know, I'm not playing with pens for 40 hours a week as much as you may like to think that that's what this job is like. Drew probably gets his hands more on pens than I do, like physically hands on pens than I do these days. Um, so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. But for me, when I do get to actually like just unplug from all the rest of the business and just get my hands on some pens and play with products, it's still like novel and fun and interesting, just like it was in like year one. You still do all of the nib nooks. Um, I do. Every new nib that comes through the doors, mm -hmm. Brian inks up and writes the same thing. So if you go to yep. the nib nook, we've got probably a thousand different nibs. It's been a lot of nibs. Up there. A lot of nibs over the years. And every one of them is him. Yeah. For better So when, Wal when Waldman came in, you did every one of those. Yeah. That, was, that was just like last week or the yeah. week before. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always new stuff that does come to Brian for sure. He writes with them, you know, regularly. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, I definitely write with my own pens and stuff all the time. But like, yeah, when new products come in, I always like to get my hands on them and see what our photographers are doing. I'm like, ooh, let me see this one. You know, so that is that is really cool. But yeah, it's not not the majority of my job like it was earlier on where I was. And like, and I think we're all the better for for that. Like there there are other things you need to be doing. Yeah, I would. The, we would have a cap on what this, <laughs> we were able to do in this business if I only just wanted to play with pens. You got to keep the but, pirate ship afloat. Yeah. Once LA stages a coup and takes over the business, she'll shove me in a corner and I'll just feed me pens every now and then and there I'll be go. happy. Um, yeah. So that's me. What about you, Drew? Um, I really love what you said about the community passion. Like yeah. it is a very much passion driven I I industry and community. So you can't really not be passionate when you're surrounded by it so much. It's kind of hard to like, miss. I think, I, I, I think one of the more. best examples is Pilot. You know, and we've mm. talked about this many times about how Pilot as a company, they make a crap ton of money selling everything but fountain pens. Fountain pens. Yeah, they could stop selling fountain pens as a, like as a Pilot Japan corporation. They could stop selling fountain pens and you probably wouldn't even notice. It'd be like a rounding error. On they they would sheet. not, their business would not <laughs> suffer. No. But the thing is, they devote, like you look at these Machia pens and like imagine all of the effort that and time and just patience and artistry that it takes. They don't do that to make money. Like they make some mm. money off them because they're expensive pens, but they do it. They keep that alive and going because of tradition and yeah. passion. Yeah. It's and like the heart of the business. So yeah. you can point to the entire fine writing division of fountain pen and say that only exists because of passion. Pretty and, much, yeah. And when you when you can point to one of the biggest brands in the world that makes fountain pens, arguably the most successful one, and say it doesn't even need to exist and only exists because they're super into it, then like that you could that the backbone in this entire industry is passion. Yeah, you can kind of make that whole argument for like fountain pens in as, general, as a yeah. product category. So it, it's like just- it, It's only here because of passion. <laughs> if you're around it enough, it is infectious. Now, yeah. that being said, I will be honest with you. I have had some lulls in the last you know, uh, 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be 12 in uh, this year, this Same. month. So yeah. it'll be 12 years for me. Yeah, a couple weeks um, So I've had lulls. I've had times where I'm just like, I'm just not into fountain pens right now. And yeah. I've had it that happens. with all, I've I've it's had natural. that with all my hobbies, you know, comics, video games, you know, kayaking, you know, what what have you. Like mm -hmm. it ebbs and flows always, yeah. but you always get back into it. You it all you always find your way back. Mm -hmm. But I will say that opposed to my other hobbies, 
I find my way back to fountain pens very quickly mm. because like comics, for example, I stopped reading comics for years. Mm. And then when I got back into them, I had to proactively kind of figure out what I missed and be like, oh my God, this happened. I wish I would have known about this. Mm. With fountain pens, you don't. I don't miss anything because I'm here every day. So right. the second something comes along that piques my interest, I'm like, oh, I'm back. Yeah. Like, so it doesn't last very long. You're just around it all the time. Right, so, because I yeah. can't, because when, when, when the trigger needs to happen, when the excitement trigger needs to happen, I'm always there for it. I can't, I can't miss it like, you know, some development in another hobby industry. Mm -hmm. It's boom, always there because I'm here. Yeah. So that that I will say that they it does the lulls def, definitely do not last long. And I'm a pretty mm. excitable person. I don't know if you've noticed this. <clears throat> really? But um yeah. I uh I, I can um you know I can get jazzed up pretty easily. So it doesn't take a lot, just a little <laughs> little a little spark. Um and uh yeah, and like you said, I'm fortunate enough to be in a role where I do get to assist in the new product discussions and um in some cases um product development and ideation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that adds a really, really exciting element to it. And it's hard not to get super excited about something when yeah. you see something that uh, was, you know, partially your idea actually mm -hmm. make it into production. So, that's cool. um, yeah, I'm very fortunate there. So, mm. um, yeah, that, that's my answer. Nice. Dig it. All right. Next question, Drew. Gadzag, Gazdag Victor says, what was the last YouTube video that you watched and is it fountain pen or ink related? This is a fun one. Um, a little random, but you know, it's somewhat fountain pen related. Okay. I will say no. The last video I watched on YouTube was not fountain pen related. Hmm. Um, the last video I watched like from beginning to end was a, uh, it's a video game review kind of channel called uh, Before You Buy. It's like a, okay. um, it's not like a video game review necessarily, but it's kind of like if you're considering buying this game, here are the things you need to know whether you like it or not. This game has a lot of that. If you like the previous one, this one's actually pretty different or it's okay. pretty much the same. So I, I I like that series a lot because they're not talking about all the details because I don't need to know the details. I just need to know. That's not like a playthrough. Does it, does it have stuff that I'm into? Right. Okay. And I watched one on Zelda uh, Tears of the Kingdom because you know I've been hearing so much about that. And I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't love Breath of the Wild. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll like this one if it's different. <gasps> and then I know I'm it's just, but it's a thing. But I watched this video and they were like, yeah, it's pretty much like Breath of the Wild, but with more building elements. I'm like, okay, you know what? Not not for me. Like that that's hmm. not that doesn't get me excited. So it was really helpful. It was very just pragmatic, like, is this is this going to hit your bullseye? Right, so I love right. that I love that YouTube series for it that sounds reason. Very helpful, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's led me to a bunch of like it led that series led me to uh, buying The Witcher 3, which is become one of my favorite games of all hmm. time. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think it's really handy. But the video I watched before that was fountain pen related. I had actually watched two recent ones. Um, one of them was from uh, Pens and Tea. Uh, Carrie over there did a video on um, top five pens I used to talk about but never mention anymore. And I thought that was a really clever concept. That's a catchy title. And she opened up with saying, saying something like, I thought this was a really dope idea. So I figured I'd do it. I'm like, I agree. That is a dope idea. Hmm. Um, we may have to hitch on that dope idea and do something like I, that ourselves. I'm pretty sure. I, I'm Yeah, I, I think that'd be totally fine. I, I just, because that totally happens, right? You're super into pens for a long time. Hmm. And then like you and your blue custom 74, like for a long time, that was like, the pen but then mm -hmm. you know it, you carry around some other pens and it takes a little bit of a backseat it doesn't mean that you don't love you're it anymore you're trying to say about my custom 74 i'm you're saying like, like you, i don't you, like that pen anymore no no no. You, you just talk about it less than you used to well it's because it gets talked about for me so there you go that so i don't have to mention so it that that would much. that would be that would be a reason in, in said video so anyway i just thought okay. that was super clever Interesting. you know I, I like that spin. That's cool. Um, yeah. Um, one other thing I love about Carrie is that sometimes she'll have random, she'll clip a, a lav mic to a random object. In this case, uh, you know, uh, sometimes if she gets a recent Goulet order, she'll attach it to a Tootsie Pop and just like kind of talk into it. She's hilarious. <laughs> like a yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's fun. Love it. And then I recently watched uh, Fig Boots video on the um, Visconti Opera Gold. Oh, yeah. Um, cause okay. we, we didn't do a video review on that one, but I love that pen. I wanted to kind of yeah. hear, hear what he said about that. Yeah. And, he does know. a good job. Yeah. So I watched those. So those are my two most recent fountain pen videos I watched. Um, and I've also been hooked on these, uh, it's a video series called the worst movie ever. And it focuses 
just on Steven Seagal films and how <laughs> utterly horrible they are. Wow. And he always talks in a voice like this, like it's one long trailer. And but he'll it, it, the voice is actually I kind, think of, I kind know of annoying. What, I think I've probably seen. Some like, of and these. then Seagal shows up conveniently because he's walking by the alley when the girl's getting kidnapped and shoots them both, and <laughs> karate chops a wall and has the building come down. Like it's just mm. it's so just insane these movies and how they get made. I don't understand. They are so utterly bad. Like there was one where he was talking about how Stigall was having a fight scene sitting on a chair because he's just so lazy. He just sits there like does doesn't he want to stand up? No, he's just like doing judo <laughs> and the guy's like flying over his arm and oh, it just wow. I don't know why I keep watching them because honestly they make me mad. But yeah, I'm watching those and then um, <laughs> for whatever reason I've been really sucked into uh, top ten pro wrestling videos like. Top oh, wow. 10 entrance themes, top 10 moments where Stone Cold <laughs> went off script, top 10 mm. Undertaker, these, like, I I don't know, man. Even, like, being a YouTuber, you know that, like, this is clickbait. Like, I, I'm watching, I like, love it. top 10 lists and roundups I and all love that it. kind of I'm, stuff. I am here for it. I, 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 will, I will eat up some top 10 WWE videos. <laughs> There's a reason why they <laughs> work know. on YouTube, right? Oh, gosh. Feed, yep. the, feed that algorithm. Yep. Feed the beast. I'm a mark. Yeah. Um, I, are you, are you, are you good? Are yeah, you that's it Okay. Me. All right. I, I watch a lot of YouTube. I do. On I my, know. On I know. Phone. Yeah. You're like, when you do dishes, like you've always got it up. I do. Yeah. Part of it's just like, helps me get my mind off things. Mm-hmm. Helps me, you know, just whatever. I have it stuff that's kind of like in the background. I do a lot of like podcasts and audiobooks too, but sometimes like a lot of my audiobooks are like nonfiction, you know, like business leadership type books. And sometimes I'm like, all right, this feels like I'm just working still i'm like i need something to like divert and just be kind of in the background if one i one of these if days, i learn something and pick up something cool if not it's just fine it can just one of these days we're going to get you to read a fiction book brian one day i have read a fiction book i read one last year i read 1984 george Orwell, and then i actually read animal farm a couple months ago no I, i'm talking about like those are fiction 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 those are fiction like, like what do you mean fiction like fiction. something with dragons Oh, like a fantasy book? Dragons they're or too long, dragons man. or spaceships. There's no, there's none that are like, they're all the fiction books. They're like this freaking long. <laughs> what about I'm Stephen like, King? Have you ever read any Stephen King? I have. Hmm, I don't know if I made it all the way through The Stand, which is like 1,100 Dude, pages. Dude, that took me a year. I think I started reading it. There's no way I finished that. No, that's, that's a heavy, that's long. a heavy duty. I, would not I started see. reading that one because I heard good things about it. And I was like, this is not. For no, me, I would not start to with like stand. Yeah, that was a big one. But anyway, keep going. I interrupt. No, I read um, on a pale horse. What is? It? I think that was. Who was it? I think that was in like fifth grade. I read that. I'm going way back because I don't read a lot of fiction. I know. Um, who was the uh, Piers Anthony? I want to say is that a author? No idea. Not Piers Morgan. That's the that's the <laughs> TV no. guy. Whatever. Piers Anthony. I think it was. Anyway. I I read it and I was like, this is entertaining, but I'm like, I don't get. It. Like, I can't keep up with. <laughs> Alternate worlds and even like <laughs> Rachel does like Animal Crossing. She's she's really into the Zelda stuff. Yeah. We're gonna transition into that on my part, but I can't remember the crap. I'm like, what is this thing you're talking about? The fling flams and the <laughs> floozy bots and the you gotta collect the jingle jams and oh bring them to God. the shoehorn maker. And I'm like, where the heck? I'm like, ah, this is I can't deal with this. Like I need to be somewhat grounded in reality. Otherwise, I'm just literally like, what's going on? I can't remember. So like when I try to read fiction, I'm just mostly confused because I can't remember anything. I, 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 that sometimes happens with me in fiction. <laughs> like I read a book called The Three Body Problem last year. Okay. It broke my brain. Oh. It broke my brain. It's fun. I enjoyed it. it was I don't want great, my brain broken. It was a great book, but man, it, it just, yeah. it's a popular book. I think it's getting a Netflix series, I think, but it, okay. it, it was, ooh, I need to try again. Well, I like YouTube videos because I like doing stuff and it's it's a format where I learn really well. Yeah. Like I learn very visually and I'm like I've watched I've learned a whole ton of woodworking and Rubik's cube solving and welding and all kinds of stuff. It's just a format that works really well for me, that visual format, so I learn a ton by doing that. But, you know, so I definitely watch plenty of that type of content, you know. Um literally like the last video that I watched, I watch, I may have, I may have watched one this morning. So I'd have to like actually pull it up. Let me see what I did. I pulled this up as a last night when I was prepping this video, but let me, let me get super current and okay. just see what is the last thing that I've watched on here. Mm, that's a good point. Um, why people with ADHD struggle to remember things. 
That was the last video that I watched, <laughs> <laughs> which is ironic. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff. I watch a lot of stuff of like history and science and again, a lot of nonfiction. Coincidentally, the two most recommended, The Undertaker from 87 to 2023 mm -hmm. and Steven Seagal worst movie ever. There you go. <laughs> the first two things that pop up. Big Brother's listening on your oh, phone. Oh, golly. Um, so last night when I was doing it, I was watching uh, the last video I had watched as of 11.32 p.m. Uh, it was Lex Friedman interview with Stephen Wolfram on how Jet, Chat GPT works. Oh my God, of course. It's pretty on brand. Of course. My previous video with, to that was a Harvard Business Review about the difference between planning and strategizing. Mm -hmm. Before that was a podcast of comedians, Christina P. Um, and that one was pretty goofy. Um, and then it was a Bloom's TD6 boss tutorial because they just wow. put out a new boss event. If you look at my YouTube history, you're like, how many people are watching this channel? Yes, yes. Because I am all over the place. Yeah, like those all four videos are like, you, the this first two were kind of connected, but then the other, like, no, you're, you're gone. It's, it's I'm, I'm like that, I jump around. Wow. I jump, jump around quite a bit. Because it's sometimes I'm like doing the dishes and I'm like, you know, if there's like something like business related and they're showing like lots of graphs and math and stuff, I'm like, I can't be looking at that while I'm doing how this can, thing. How so can let me come back so to that one. How can you be so obsessed with a like, science fiction series like Severance, but yet not want to read a book about it? Uh, probably the format, maybe just because it's visual. Oh. Like the reading is, I'm a really slow reader. Oh, okay. And like trying to like remember details and stuff. That's why probably why I watch Severance so many times because it's like so much of it is <laughs> new to me. Each time I watch it, I watch it through like 10 times and I'm like, oh, that's the first I picked up on that, you know. You're, you're a, speci a special creature, special, Brian. Special, special bird, yeah. Anyway, that's me. I'm all, all right. over the place. Yeah, you are. All over the place. All right, you want to wrap this up Let's with do number it. five? Last question, here we number go. Number five from Aaron Cusenberry. Mm. How different is the writing experience with a $1,000 pen versus a $60 pen? Is it worth it? Oh, it's always worth it, of course. Ah! You should buy the most expensive pens you can. No, I'm just kidding. Um, surely there's gonna be a difference that most people would notice. There will be a difference. That much don't of a, call me Shirley. With that, well said. Well said. Um, with that much of a price difference, I'm pretty sure most people could tell. Even if you're not, that independent, you can probably tell a difference in the way that that writes, especially because you're kind of crossing the chasm there between into steel nibs into gold. That's where you, again, generalizing here, but you're going to see a a difference between gold and steel nibs, mostly because of the softness of the gold material. And generally gold nib pens are more expensive. There might be some more hand tuning and stuff involved with them. Um, so they might, you know, write a little differently and, and be more specific and stuff like that, um, specifically tuned. So yeah, you can mostly tell a difference. Maybe not every single pen across the board, that kind of a thing. So you get all kinds of other things like in the brand name and, you know, material of the pen and stuff like that, that may or may not matter for the writing experience itself, you know? So I'm almost say across the board, every pen. You can certainly get very reliable, very pleasing writing pens for $60. Like for some people, that's the ultimate experience and they never need anything more. They try other pens and they're like, it's literally no better of an experience for me. So I'm never gonna go above X dollars and they stay there and they're happy forever. And that's yep. very admirable. Yep. And honestly, probably, much more affordable than getting into more expensive stuff. But um, what you can usually expect when you jump up in price, especially to that degree, again, the gold nib instead of the steel, going back to like the Pelican, Pelican makes a bunch of less expensive steel nib pens, the Pelicano and you know things like that. Those are less expensive. You go to an M1000, you're gonna notice a huge difference in the way that that feels. Um, so yeah, that right there is gonna be the biggest jump. Um, the attention given to the pen at the factory is more likely to be greater with a pen of that price, um, less likely to maybe have any issues or any tuning that uh, might be needed, though maybe nothing is perfect. Um, uh, probably the warranty and the service behind a more expensive pen is much more likely to be longer and be more in depth and that kind of a thing. Um, so you might have that, including like coverage of the nib and the way that it writes. Again, generalization. Um, you may likely have more nib options. Like when you get into the really expensive pens, you can get, some specialty grinds and like double broads and obliques and things like that when you get into like the higher end, you know, I'm using Pelican as an example, just cause we have some experience with them. Um, you get some of that. Whereas the less expensive pens, you're pretty much getting like 
the sta- the more standard offerings, yeah. maybe a stub, you know, if you're getting crazy. Um, on the more expensive pens, and again, I'm kind of sticking mostly to things that impact the writing experience, not other aspects like, you know, aesthetics. Um, you're more likely to have a larger ink capacity or maybe a more complex filling mechanism that might impact some of your writing experience, you know, getting into piston fillers and things that have, you know, so if you want to write for longer periods, again, generalization, but typically less expensive pens, you're looking cartridge converter, you know, fillers. Whereas you get more expensive ones, you get into the pistons and the vacuums and the aromatics and the other things like that, that could be more interesting. Um, And you're more likely to see some special material, which material in and of itself may or may not matter, but some of the material I'm thinking like the homo sapiens lava material, maybe some unique resins or celluloids or things like that, they can give a different feel in your hand, which in turn can maybe influence some of like your grip or certain aspects of it that, yeah, that's that might be experience. more interior. Yeah, that kind of fits. Yeah. Not not related to the nib or the ink flow necessarily, um, but it might it might matter. And especially like, I feel like maybe not necessarily based on price of the pen, but probably more so on like popularity and how long the pen's been around and all that. The ones that have stood the test of time, I feel like have really figured out things like balance, you know, and, you know, feel in the hand, they're comfortable to write with, you know, some of the more, you know, intangible qualities, I guess, that have kind of stood the test of time. You might get some more of that on some more expensive pens because there are more like tried and true, you know, kind of things that have been figured out because, you know, it's mostly not, you know, startup, um, you know, uh, boutique pen makers that are making thousand dollar pens, you know, who are doing more experimental things. It's probably, you know, companies that have been around for decades and have, have some tried and true things in there. Um, and then there's going to be lots of other factors beyond just how they write, but that's pretty much what I'll stick to, just to the writing aspects. Yeah. Um, well, the well only well thing covering. I'll mention, yeah, I agree with all that. The only thing I'll probably mention is that the writing experience overall, like if you were to say a, uh, you know, if you've got a $60 pen that has like a, let's say five out of 10 writing experience, mm-hmm. you definitely don't need to go all the way up to a thousand to get a 10 out of 10 writing experience yeah there is a law of diminishing returns when it comes to pens yeah i mean pretty much like if you want the feel of what a gold nib pen does pretty much like once you step into gold nibs you're there you're kind of there like most of what you pay for beyond once you step into some of like the the base level gold nibs you're still you get into a few hundred dollars you're you're buying you're buying things that aren't directly relating to the writing experience yeah per se yeah the nib is pretty much optimized in the three to $400 realm. Yeah. And if, then you, you, if it's a gold nib. And then you're getting into like personal preferences and stuff. Like if you get a Namiki Emperor, yeah. you know, the cheapest one you can get is like two grand, you know, but it's a huge nib on that thing. It's not everybody's preference. You could argue that maybe that's not even better depending on it, mm-hmm. what you're looking for, you know, but if it's, if that's specifically what you want, yeah, that's going to be something that is going to be not even possible at the $60 level. So, you know, the, the further, the higher up you go in price, Basically, especially because fountain pens are such a, you know, kind of, again, we talked about like the passion and stuff earlier in this pen gas, but it's such a preferential and an individually like personalized preferential hobby. The higher up you go in price, essentially, it's not like the quality is necessarily getting way better. You're just getting way more specific and unique. And it's like a supply and demand thing to where, you know, there's just not mass production, mass availability for something so specific at that level. So you're paying for something that is really quite unique and quite specific, and you're probably paying, you know, a premium for that. Or you very well could be paying a premium for the brand name that does exist. Sure. You know, yeah, that's that, a fact. That's definitely a fact. That's a fact. That yeah. can happen at the sixty dollar level too. Certainly. You can be. You can buy less expensive pens where you're like you're using it, and you're like this would cost a quarter of the price from another brand. Like I'm basically paying for the brand name, you know, and that happens too. That could happen at any price level, but yep. yeah, there you go. Well, hopefully that helps you out somewhat, but honestly, part of what I love about found pens is you can, you can get into them and have a great experience at almost any price point. It's yep. pretty, pretty good. I saw a comment. It might've been a comment, might've been an email, but someone contacted me through some channel and said that they picked up their pilot varsity which is, I think, the most affordable pen we sell. A sub-$4 pen, I think, yeah. After 
they said that it had been sitting in a drawer. They bought a pack of them, and this was like one of the only ones that hadn't been lost. Bought it in 2014. Okay. Still wrote like no Seven problem. years ago. Just effortlessly the first time, no hard starts or anything. That's pretty solid. So yeah, you can get an excellent writing experience <laughs> at any price point. That's pretty That's pretty good. Yeah. Those things, come, those things come preloaded with ink. So yeah. like that ink was sitting in there that whole time. That says a lot about the cap. That is impressive. Mm -hmm. That is impressive. I was like, that's as old as my son. Wow, that's wild. Um, well, anyway, please ask us more questions either in the comments on YouTube. You can email us at pencast at gooleypens.com if you're an audio listener. And uh, yeah, that's what we got. All right. We're going to do a uh, do you pen wanna... spotlight? We can do the spotlight. Yeah. I think we got time. Yeah. Let's check out the Lamy logo. Is this thing here for a reason? We're going to use the bat? Yeah, the mat? just to eliminate the shine yeah. a little bit. All right. Bit. Cut, cut down the shine. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll do an unboxing here. All right. We got pro video happening again. Ooh. There we go. All right. We're going to do an official unboxing That's here. That's right. Because I'm sure many of you have never seen Look at that a Lamy, Lamy box. box. So this is a logo. This is like a, kind of an obscure pen in the Lamy lineup. It doesn't is. get a lot of the, love. The uh, idea for this came from Glenn, our lead product photographer, because Ooh, he nah. had recently rephotographed this one and didn't know it existed. You know, and it's uh, one that that especially if you're looking on the website in like a white background, it mm -hmm. just kind of like blends in. You're like, what is this? Um, it was interesting because when I went to tour the Lamy factory, they definitely have like the main bulk of their production is things like the safaris and like that kind of stuff. But all of their metal pens are kind of in this like other section of their factory. And they had like the logo and the pure and some of the other like brushed aluminum ones. And they're kind of in their, their own little special section. And I remember looking over there and being like, oh, that's cool. It's like its own little, it's like its own little place. Um, so, I mean, it's clear just by their factory, like this is not the mainstay of what they do. Right. I think it's just kind of a neat and novel thing um, that they make. So um, it's a, this particular pen, they've made it in, a couple different colors, a couple different versions. They haven't all been metal. I feel like some of them have been like a brushed lacquer type of thing, sort of like they do with the studios sometimes. Yeah, we've They've only ever special had editions. two, and now we only have one. Yeah. I don't know if that's because Lamy doesn't offer it, or maybe we discontinued it. I don't know. It's not a vastly popular pen, but no. if you're familiar with the Lamy format, same steel nibs that you would have on any Lamy pen. So you can swap those nibs in between them, get a stub on there or whatever. Same feed mechanism. So it's all very familiar. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to write just like a Safari or an All Star, um, or any of those that you might be familiar with. It is aluminum though. Did you mention that? It is aluminum. So it actually feels very light, very for, light. for what it is. And I what I do like about it, I mean, it's a brushed aluminum. So it's got kind of that like, um, I don't know, like it almost has like a shimmery kind of aspect to it, right? Yeah, it looks nice. So, you know, it catches catches the light, but it's not as slick as, you know, uh, uh, shiny metal would be. That back piece is plastic though, isn't it? This feels plastic, yeah. 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 But it's got, it's, similar, it's got it's some, it's like got some little notches to it for- um, It the, does. I think the, that's for- For, for the cap. For, for pressure to keep, yeah, to keep the cap fitting tight That's interesting. On I think it's similar to like how the CP1 is. I think it is. Yeah, that's kind of how that's designed. Let's take a look at that cap. It's a really unique cap. Yeah, the cap is interesting. Lamy's known for having some very interesting clips and cap things. Um, it's got a spring clip on it, sort of like the Lamy 2000 does. A um, which very, is, which is yeah, nice. So that's very mobile spring. Yeah, and it's not it's not really stiff. So it's it, it makes it kind of easy to you know just push up on it. So if you're actually putting this in your pocket, you can literally grab it you know, and squeeze it like that and put it down into your pocket mm -hmm. and then let it grab onto your Let's shirt. Let's look at that top view of that thing too, because that, that's a really interesting. So that, yeah. you can almost, you can see the spring in there actually. Can you? Yeah, a little bit. I don't know how easily. Yep, can I can get. see it right there. Yeah. Hello. Bah. So really bah, unique, bah, bah. really unique <laughs> design. Bah, my cap. Anyway, um, yeah, it's got the Lamy uh, The Lamy logo. logo. Yeah, look at that. It's a, uh, I don't know what the technical term is for that. Not it's not brushed, emblazoned uh, down on there. Let's see here what's going on inside. It's dark. It's dark inside the cap. I don't know if it has any kind of like insert in there. I feel like it's not like one that I would tout as being the most ink. Yeah, wettest. Lamy uh, in general, you know, I wouldn't say that about. I feel like pretty milk, pretty yeah. road for most of them. Yeah, um, but it's adequate. Um, and then you get the inside of the pen here, so it's got the same you know, guts as the rest of the Lamy pen. So it uses the Lamy cartridges, converters, and so on. Um, does this one come with, this comes with a cartridge. 
your typical Lamy Blue cartridge. Does not come with a converter. Um, so you would need to add that. I think with this one, you have to use the Z27. Mm, yep. I think the one, the, little... the regular one, the, the one with the red that comes for the- The notches might get in the way? Yeah, the notches would get in the way. I mean, if you really were bound and determined, you could shove it in there and probably shave those notches off. Yeah, like use a flush cutter. That to just seems unnecessary. So it's not like it could be done. But you know, you get a Z27. Any Z27, the black one, you can use that on a All Star Safari. Or Anything. But if you are trying to use that one, of, an existing Z28 that you have from another pen, you may run into some issues there. It's definitely a, a pen that's a little more on the slim side. Would it you is. say? Do you think it's a little bit wider in diameter than a CP1, it or feels, about the same? It feels a little wider than a CP1, but you know that's something that I can probably pull it up on the on the site and get some stats on it. But um, or maybe we could add that after the fact, whatever. But um, let's see here. Just just from my hand and going by memory, I would say it's probably. Um, just a tad wider, but um, what's cool is the grip though. So the grip, there is a little bit of texture that you feel to it. It's very subtle though, and it's not sharp, it's very rounded. So me, because I like to haul logs around and bury them in my yard, mm -hmm. um, my fingers are maybe a little more callous than most. So I don't, I tend to not be bothered by texture as much as some others. Um, but even still, I think this is a pretty reasonable one uh, to go with. So the overall diameter on the CP1 as I'm looking it up here is diameter of the body, 9.3 millimeters. So let's see what it is on the logo. Let me feel it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not Let being me, uh, very visually stunning see. here. Yeah, I feel like it's gonna be close, but this does feel a little. We're gonna find out real A quick. little. Cause we've measured all this. Thicker. We have it on our site. Yeah. Oh, the diameter of the Lamy logo, 9.5 millimeters. So this is smaller? No, 0.2. Oh. Point two, oh, point two. Okay. larger than a CP1. Point two. Okay, so they're pretty much point the same. 0.2 millimeters, arguably no discernible, the same. No discernible difference in the hand. Yeah. Okay. But this pen is $40. You so know, they do say black is slimming. Apparently. Yeah. Apparently. Um, you I say, say 40 the, bucks? Uh, $40. Oh, I thought this logo. was more expensive than that. No. I mean, so MSRP is, is 50. We have it for Right, 40. but so this is not much more expensive than the All Star. It's right in there with the All Star. A couple, couple bucks more, maybe. But All yeah, right. it's right in there. So. I don't know if you're kind of sick of the All-Star and you want something a little slimmer. Or something, something a little bit more executive. And, because the All-Star, if, if you don't like the Safari, you're not going to like the All-Star. This is a little bit more It does, yeah. More, and if, you more don't, if you're not into that, looking. like, you know, the paperclip looking clip that they've got on those pens, you know, this one has got a different style to it. The spring clip is kind of nice. Um, yeah, this does feel a little bit more, more kind of professional. Yeah. Um, the overall weight of this is 18 grams. So it's pretty light. The body alone is 11 grams without a cartridge, without a converter. So it's... That's that's pretty light. That's about as light as almost anything else that we carry. So um, even on it's it's I want to say it's a tad lighter than a Safari actually. Even so, yeah. There you go. There you go. That's a logo. That's about all I have to say about right. that. So let us know if you've never heard of the logo or totally forgot it existed because mm -hmm. I bet you you're not alone. Yeah, give it a little love. Check it out. It's a worthy pen. The logo. How low can How you low go? can you? Oh, <laughs> I was going to say that. Both, oh. I thought of it too late. Okay. So All right. Um, what's next? What are we we're going to tell people what's happening. Oh, boy. This, what's this part of it, huh? It's time. All right. Well, let's get into some shenanigans, shall we? Shan Anna. Shan Anna Nangins. Uh, I'm going to impress you with my vulnerability here, Brian. Oh, yeah, get ready. I am impressed by vulnerability. I'm going to be brave and courageous mm. and tell people how stupid I am. Oh, this is news to all of us. I could blame it on ADHD, but I'm just going to just say I'm stupid. Here we go. Okay. So <clears throat> it sounds like you're being hard on yourself. Right. Well, I'll, I'll, this, I'll let you I haven't heard the story yet. So let's this see. Should be, this could be a game <laughs> called ADHD or stupid, you know, <laughs> you know, is it ADHD or just dumb? Or just dumb, yeah. Starring Drew again. Um, as always. Or both. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, probably both. Yeah. Friday, I uh, my gas light came on. I was like, uh-oh. Try not to let that happen, but it does. I leave here. There's a reason they have those lights on. Right? I know. I, le <laughs> I leave here. I go to the gas station, open up my door, grab the pump. No, no, grab my wallet. Mm -hmm. Realize my card's not in my wallet. Uh-oh. I gave it to Shannon to go somewhere to get something. I don't know. Hmm. She borrowed my car for something. And then... I was like, well, ah, crap. Well, I need to go home and uh, I've got enough to get home. I'm sure my little thing says, you uh -oh. know, 40 some miles. I'm like, ah, that's plenty. Mm. 
So I uh, go to pick up my son from his after school program. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I tell him, Archer, I need to get some gas. I'm almost out. So I go to the gas station, open the door, pull out my wallet, <laughs> realize my wallet doesn't have my card Still in there. The card. Still, it didn't magically appear. This after... was like 10 minutes later, Brian. <laughs> wow. Completely gone from my brain. Wow. And I'm whole, I'm standing there like, you idiot. What? <laughs> wow. How did you just, you just went to the... Like it literally wasn't until you pulled your wallet back out. Yes, I went there. I stopped at a pump. I'm like, mm. oh my God. Mm. So that's, that's, that's number one thing. Okay. Okay. Um, that could happen to anybody, you know. Thank you. You got stuff going on, especially like you pick up your son. He starts talking about his day. There we go. All right. You're like on autopilot. There, it's, 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 that's explainable. You. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> this morning. Oh boy. Uh, There's more. <laughs> this is not the first time it happened, but it was definitely the most chaotic. Uh, I was downstairs. I was had this shirt on mm -hmm. and then I was wearing a pair of pants that were a little bit more baggy than the shirt was and it just looked a little silly. I went to the bathroom oh. and looked in the mirror. I'm like, oh, your pants are billowing out in a way that your shirt is not. Interesting. So I was like, okay. I, I, I need to put on, put on some some more, you know, fitting pants. Mm. So I uh, started my coffee, ran up to, you know, change my pants. And because that, that sometimes happens. I have like, I have some bigger pants for bigger shirts. Like you don't want mm. one to be, you don't want a big floofy shirt and a little tiny tight jeans. But mm. you also don't want, you know, tighter shirt and big floofy pants. I don't know. I care about that things. I don't okay. know. I don't have any tight pants. But, so I got, you know me, I got a pretty, I got a pretty uh, defined look <laughs> about me. I don't have a lot of looks. So I had gone up to, to change my <laughs> pants, came back down, the coffee maker was making coffee oh, straight no. onto the counter. No cup. Oh. Wow. And it had been oh, gosh. for quite a while. Oh, gosh. <laughs> There was an I, I was wow. I was I was supposed to have used this so like I'm not mm. making a little tiny teacup, mm. so it was all over overflowing the little coffee overfill oh, thing yeah. all mm. over the counter and the coffee oh, coffee sucks. counter is right next to the refrigerator so guess where all the oh, coffee had gone like under the fridge poured over right there's there's no oh, space man. between my refrigerator and that part of the thing so and, and I it had so much had gone out that it started leaking from under the fridge oh gosh so. <laughs> I had to pull the fridge. Oh my now, I've gosh. never, so we've been in the house for three years and I haven't pulled the fridge out. Oh, yet. so it's going to be like coffee with there was some, lots of other things in it. There was some stuff. Oh gosh, that's so gross. There was some stuff. I probably have not pulled my fridge out in three years. There's probably someone. So it was, it was, it was there. there before we moved in. Like oh, it conveyed. Boy. Oh, so who knows how long mm -hmm. since that thing was pulled out. Uh huh. Oof. So. I just, and I had done that before. This is like yeah. my third time doing it, but this is the only time I walked oh, away. You got dogs too. The dog hair? Was there dog hair under the Oh, there's always dog fridge? hair. There's oh. dog hair everywhere. I don't need dogs. If you look so at, I just end up with human If hairs. you look at my house, you'll get dog hair on you. <laughs> if you drive by, you will get dog hair <laughs> on you. This is wafting in the air yeah. as you're opening the yeah, window. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so wow. it's magnetized. <laughs> so that was great. That was a great way to start my oh, morning. That's, Shannon that's Shannon helped rough. me. She that's was rough. chilling on the couch, not having to go to work yet, but she got up. <sighs> she got down there with me and we, we cleaned I, it all up. Did it get like, so I've had this happen before where I've like had a pot that's overflowed mm -hmm. or one time we had a watermelon that for whatever reason, it was a perfectly fine looking watermelon, but it just decided that it was gonna like rot from underneath oh. and it like split open and all the juices <sighs> leaked out of the watermelon. It smelled so bad. Oh yeah. And it like leaked down the lip of the countertop and then like came down the front of the cabinets and like dripped down into the cabinets and pooled like in the bottom. Got all like, and it dripped all over like the pans that were inside oh. the cabinet. And I was just like, I've had that happen either with like pots overflowing at our stovetop. Oh man. Because we've got like a stovetop and a separate oven. So there's cabinets underneath the stovetop. So if anything overflows, it goes down underneath where we store all the pots. And I'm like, now I'm doing a whole thing of dishes and I gotta clean up this mess. Yeah. It sucks. So it was just a just a great, great moment where I'm just like, <sighs> all right, let me make my coffee. I'm just I'm thinking about my pants now. Yeah, you're in pants. And I just pants hit, mode. I just I just hit the button and then boop, gone. Like just the, the the pants thing just totally overtook the coffee thing in mm. in, in that moment. Yep. So that was that was a thing. Gosh. But but I do have a victory. I do have a victory. So every day I get out of my car. Okay. Um, I park on the left side of the driveway. Shannon's on the right, and so I'm on the side of the shrubs. So I've got some mm -hmm. little like you know 
kind of standard. Have you trimmed those shrubs yet or do you still need to? All right, here's the thing. <laughs> I know I've talked about this. So you every, brought this up so many times. As soon as you said shrubs, I'm every thinking, day, have you trimmed those shrubs yet? <laughs> every day I get out, I'm like, ah, the shrubs. <laughs> because every day it's like more and more in my first. I'm like, ah, shrubs. Yeah. <laughs> and every day I'm like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to come right back out and trim the shrubs. There you I, go. I just forget. No. I, I walk in. I'm like, shut up, dogs. Yeah. And then it's gone. That's true. I and imagine then, as soon as you come in the house, there's like dogs and noises and there's so many, just everything, so many stimulus, everything, stimuli. Okay. That's fair. Um, and just again, whoop, totally overwrites anything yeah. else I had in my brain. But yeah. this weekend, you did. I trimmed the shrubs. Hey, congratulations! Shrubs. And I waited so long that the big shrub, I trimmed it down, and it's not green anymore. Yep, because all that the happens. all the exterior things have been gone it'll so. grow back it'll grow back yeah it'll be fine you can't kill that thing so now it's just like dead like it's got some branches and stuff on, on it, the inside yeah pretty much just dead yeah it's pretty i've cool. done that before too but uh, i was all nervous because i'd seen a lot of bird activity in some of the shrubs and i didn't want to disturb any baby birds oh yeah so i was very careful this is the time when that's happening i kind of like shook them at first to see if anything flew out you know and mm. kind of i got kind of under them just to look up because you can see kind of if there's a nest in there by getting up yeah, under maybe, maybe so it was fine I, so I found one nest but there was nothing in it okay um Probably old nest then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So yeah, that's my. Is it ADHD You're or stupid? Your hedges. Um, but uh, we'll leave that up to the commenters to decide. Thank you. I think they're all fairly justifiable I think, things. You I know? think. The, I think. Yeah, they'll be understandable. Everybody will understand. There, there's there's plenty of us out there. They know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Mother's Day. So uh, did a thing for Shannon, my wife, on Mother's Day. Uh, Archer came down. We made her breakfast in bed. Uh, she wanted a, a um, bacon uh, bacon egg and cheese on toast. I was like, yeah, it's easy enough. I can make okay. that happen. And, yeah. and some cinnamon rolls. So Archer mm -hmm. was in charge of the cinnamon rolls. He took care of business there. I'm getting hungry. I did the bacon, did the bacon on the cast iron uh, skillet, which I had not used since having a glass top uh, stove because I heard they were dangerous, but turns out they're really not. You just need to be careful with them. Oh, don't. I use cast iron. I've got a glass. Yeah. You, you just don't whack it on the glass and you'll, yeah. be, you'll be fine. So yeah. I was brave enough to do that. Stunk up the house, made it smell like bacon for the whole day. So, yep. but I didn't want to put it in the oven because I'm making cinnamon rolls in there, and mm. that would make the cinnamon, cinnamon rolls smell like bacon. So, anyway, what's the problem here? Got that done. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> got that done. Uh, so, got her the little tray. We take it up there. We've done this before, and uh, you know, had a little balloon, a little flower, and Archer got his gift and Aww. his card that he made, and we're walking up there. And this is like 9 a.m. And every other time we've done this, you know, for the past three years or so, she's like gotten up, you know, gone to the bathroom, come back to bed and just kind of waited because she knew what was going to happen. Yeah. This time she was all the way asleep. Like out cold. Out cold. So I walk in there. I'm <laughs> like, like, what do I do? Yeah. I'm like, hey. And Arch is like, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> like, huh? What? <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm just holding a plate of food. <laughs> It's like here, yeah. have food. Here, you you have an obligation. And now. she's just like, oh god, what? She's I, like half dreaming. Still oh my probably. god, I should have gone up there and been like, hey, just so you know, we're all, we're almost done. Yeah, we're gonna make like, a bunch of noise and like. I thought she would be up, her. but no, she was one hundred percent asleep when she woke up. So that was nice. That was new. Nice. That hadn't happened before. Did she receive it well? Was she? Like, she did. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's yeah, good. She that's was. Good. She was fine. She was happy. Nice. <laughs> um, but, uh, so that was interesting. Um, we spent the day with her, uh, that was Saturday. And then, uh, uh we went to, um, you know, get some, uh, Italian for lunch cause you know, she's super into that. And, uh, then she had a show that night, which, um, you know, went, went, went really well. I took Archer to the show. Um, and he had been before I hadn't, and it was, it was really nice. She was amazing. Mm. She, she just did a, a awesome. exceptional job. Um, she, when she got eaten by the plant, her feet didn't make it in all the way. Because oh. she gets she she's she's dead, so she gets placed in there. So she can't oh. like get into all. It really depends on how she is placed. Right. So I saw her little feet sticking out, <laughs> and I see them slowly kind of like get drawn in. <laughs> but both of her shoes fell off. So you you just see clump clump. <laughs> That's funny. And, but everybody laughed at it. Yeah. So I think she said she was going to do it again. So nice. anyway, so it went fun. well. The only thing that bugged me was um. So there's this song in there that her character Audrey sings. It's called Somewhere That's Green. It's like this mm -hmm. dream sequence where she dreams. About about leaving, you know, the the scummy part of town and yeah. living in a, you know, suburb with you know white picket fence and all that, and you know, it's called somewhere that's green. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the end, uh, you know, spoiler alert, sorry if you haven't seen Little Shop of Horrors, she dies and she gets eaten by the plants. And before she dies, she kind of mentions, you know, well, you know, don't you understand? I'll finally be somewhere that's green. And the whole audience laughs at that. And I don't, 
I don't, I'm like, that, that, that bugged me. I'm like, that's not funny. It's, 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 uh, somber and like mm. kind of like a, it's, it's sad if anything, mm. at least I thought it was like, and everybody's laughing. I'm just kind of like, I don't know if it's because my wife and she's doing something serious or huh. I don't, I don't think that's funny. I don't know. That bothered me. Why? Because she's getting eaten by the plant and the she's plant about to, is green? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, but everybody thought that was hilarious. I'm like, I don't think that's supposed to be funny. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, hmm. but that that kind of bugged me. Interesting. Yeah. Well. Anyway. Um. Yeah. Mother's Day went fine. Uh. Or the day after. Anyway. So it's officially Mother's Day now. <clears throat> I go over to my brother's house, which was amazing because my mm. brother very rarely plans family events, and he reached out to me. He's like, "Hey, how about Mother's Day at my place? I'll make pizza with my pizza oven." I was like, "Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's fantastic. Great. Good job, bro." So we went over there. My mom was there. Um, uh, my brother Chad has a hammock um, out back, and he usually has like a standard knit hammock, but he got a new one. It's like uh, canvas, yeah. white, white canvas. Yeah. And Archer just loved that thing. He got super excited. So That's he was awesome. swinging that like for hours. Um, pizza was great. My brother just he makes his own dough and everything like that. He's oh, a big wow. he's a big bread guy. Um, does okay. you know his he has his like starter, and he loves making focaccia like. Big bread nerd that, nice. that Chad. Nice. Um, and uh, we get home after all that. And I'm playing video games. Archer's up ter- upstairs playing his tablet. And he comes down. And he, I hear him coughing upstairs. And like mm. like kind of a bark. And he comes down. And he's like having trouble talking. And he just says like, I need help. And like at first I thought he was choking. Mm. So I asked him like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he, he can breathe fine. But he's like, his... his he can't speak without coughing. Hmm. And in that moment, I realized I just for hours let my severely pollen allergic son roll around on a pollen filled blanket, essentially, oh, with gosh. that hammock. Like it was oh. under two trees made of cloth. Mm. I didn't even think about it. That the pollen was like, yeah. Oh, all over. He was rolling around that, his oh, face gosh. in it. And I just was like, oh, oh no. no. So I immediately got him up into the, um, I was like, hey, take a shower, go sit just in the, mm. in the, in the bathroom. I'm going to, no, sorry, grab a comic, go sit in the, sh- in the bathroom. I'm going to crank the shower up, get you yeah. some steam. Yeah. Um, that, you know, fixed the voice thing almost mm. immediately. Gave him some Benadryl, uh, and, uh, knocked him out that night. Obviously we went to our friends for dinner and he was just like, useless <laughs> um Benadryl will do that but uh yeah oh, he oh, um poor kid yeah she he stayed home yesterday mm. and shannon took him to the doctor and uh he when he was younger and this would happen he was mm. given a nebulizer um, yeah yeah so that had long expired and you know with the older kids they actually give him an inhaler so he's got inhalers now okay um and uh yeah so mm. That was that was a little rough, and I just yeah. I should have thought about that. I did not even consider the well, fact that that he's was like he's like reaching that age too, where it's like he, you know, he's going to be doing stuff at school or doing yeah. stuff like at other kids' houses. And he stuff needed one eventually. Like, well, yeah, and like and even just for his own awareness, like it's a good lesson for him because like I mean, you weren't thinking about the pollen, yeah, you know, but now he'll be more conscious of it, you yeah, know? like. So we've got one yeah. at his school now, um, and uh, it was interesting. The uh, I didn't know about this. I've never had an inhaler, but hmm. rather than just taking a direct hit of the of the inhaler, like as it, you know, you know, injects its or bursts medicine into your face, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, for kids, they have this like um, additional tube that hmm. you kind of, you know, I don't want to say squirt, you know, spew whatever expel the medicine into this yeah. chamber uh-huh. and then you just slowly inhale what's being held in this chamber oh, it's okay. like a spacer so that kids so don't have to go getting, you know all so you're not you know. spraying it directly into your right throat. right yeah. so i was like oh that's cool so he just oh. sprays it into the chamber and then just slowly breathes five or so breaths in, okay. um, from the chamber where everything's kind of being held hmm. so um yeah uh that was uh that was our adventure, you know, but that night we did get to go over um, Josh and Jeffrey's house and uh, our mm. other friend, Josh, other Josh made this exceptional mm. array of Vietnamese like rice bowl mm. stuff. So you got to have your rice and all the spicy stuff. And I never get spicy stuff at home. So, oh, oh, yeah. oh it was so good. And uh, I had um, chili crisp for the first time. Have you ever heard of that? Chili crisp. It's like a it's like an oil and red pepper sort of huh. uh, topping. Okay. And oh my God, it's so good. I thought about buying it before because I'd heard that it was really good. Yeah. But man, he had that. He had made up some spicy mayo. Uh, I was like, oh my God, it was so, wow. so good. And I felt so bad afterwards because I ate way too much. <laughs> and I knew it was going to happen, but I did yeah. anyway because it was just so freaking good. Yeah. 
yeah. And then, uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. I will say I got a couple comments last time, like, Drew, you never tell us what coin you're flipping around. T today, just oh. for the nerds coin, out there. Coin of the week? Yeah, coin. To, it's a, this is a, um, a dollar coin from uh, Panama, or their equivalent of a dollar coin. It's got uh, Balboa on there with his, you know, um, Spanish helmet. Mm -hmm. That dropped it. Uh, I believe that this was minted in the same mold that the American Morgan dollars were minted as. So it's the same, hmm. same, uh, same um, size. This is my cool. travel coin. Like I like it, but I don't love it. Um, mm. So whenever I travel, this is the one so I bring okay because if, if I lose if, it, or yeah, something. if I lost it, I'm not gonna like be. It's pretty beat up too. But yeah, yeah, there we go, Balboa. All right. Yep, that's that. Right on. That's what's happening with me. Cool. I actually don't have that much to update myself this week. Oh, good. So no, no kids, you know, got hit mm, with crazy allergies then. Nothing dramatic. Um, I did have, uh, Ellie had her last field day last week. She's So we're a lot of physical activities with Ellie these days. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like as the weather's been warmer and yeah. stuff like that. Marathon, and, field day. Well, it's interesting too, because like she wants to play with her brother, but Joseph basically never wants to go outside. He's kind of like Rachel. Mm. He'd be perfectly happy just staying inside for the rest of his life. Love it. Um, Rachel likes experiencing the outside without being in the outside, if that makes any sense. It doesn't. So like a screened porch or a sunroom oh, okay. or something like that. Gotcha. Like getting to feel like she's amongst the outdoors without actually being outdoors. So your Florida room must be just like perfect for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We built a built a sunroom on so she can like open the windows. She still gets pollen and all that kind of stuff. So it's always a trade-off of like, well, I'm going to have a headache later, but it's so nice out. I'm just going to deal with it. You wait, know, like, that in, kind of a thing. Wait, in the sunroom, you get pollen in, in there? In our house, yeah. Really? Well, you open up the windows. Oh, okay. Yeah, like if it's really nice. It was like this past week has been beautiful here. It's like it really has. It's like the 70s. Yeah. And the pollen's like been more manageable, but yeah. not as terrible as it's been most of the rest of the spring. Yeah. Like in Virginia, especially in Richmond here, it's basically like, even if you don't have allergies, you're gonna get obliterated by pollen. Yeah. If you have it was allergies, nice it's when I was doing the hedge trimming, like it was mm. so pleasant. Yeah. It was so overcast. Nice. I was yeah. like, oh my God, this is just this is marvelous. Like, we feel like we've actually had like a real spring last yeah. week. So been spending time outside, but yeah, Ellie had her field day and it was like, it was a bit warm. It was like 82 Fahrenheit. So that's, you know, that's on the warm side, but at this point, she's our second kid. This is fifth grade. We've been to multiple field days. We know we know how to do it now. So we brought like the folding chairs. Rachel had like an iced coffee. I had plenty of water. Nice. We got, you know, the chairs, put them down like the tree line. So we were in the shade most of the time. We'd go out and like watch her as she's doing her event. But then when they're all just BSing or whatever, we'd go back in the shade. And I was like, yeah, we got this dialed in at this point, but it's our last uh, it's our last one ever. It's kind of sad. Like Ellie, she'll be going to middle school next year and no more field days, no more recess, none of the none of that fun stuff. Yeah. It'll just be school, study, bah, Ugh. you know, but so kind of the end of an era a little bit, but yeah. it was good. She ran hard and did like relays and stuff like that. It was fun. Nice. You know, she's got she's got like my frame. So we did like the five. So it's like, stuff, you know, tiny, but, you know, petite. Yeah, just very delicate, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, just like me. Um, but no, like she's like more of a sprinter. So yeah. doing like the 50 yard dash and like relays and that type of stuff. She what was, was the she uh, was into that? What was her uh, grades shirt color? Uh, green. 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 Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what Archer's was. We just I think his was green, too, actually. For, mm. for, for uh, different school. Yeah. Third grade. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, so that was really fun. And that was that was, you know, great to get to be there with her for that. Um, on what was it that same that morning? Uh, that was what Friday morning. Um, we went early before work started and picked up a copy of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Oh, you didn't get it shipped. I didn't get it shipped. Oh. Rachel, I so, saw Rachel had it like pretty early and I was surprised. I assumed yeah, that it was like If you like get a... it shipped, you don't necessarily get it the day that it comes out. Oh. They ship it the day that it comes out. Ah. Oh. And she wanted it for the weekend. Nice. So that was kind of like an, not really a Mother's Day gift, but that was she got it part of what early. she wanted to do the Mother's Day weekend was yeah. to get to play that. That sounds awesome. Um, so yeah, she was into it. She was a big fan of Breath of the Wild. Um, and she, it was pretty smart because it's like it started to sell out like midnight at various places, like all the typical like gaming places. But she was like, you know what? I bet you Target first thing when they open up on a Friday morning probably won't like be the place that people think to go to. So that's what we did. We went to Target. There was, it was funny because they didn't have a clue what was happening. They had the game, 
But like the dude working the counter was like, what are you, the what is it? Some <laughs> Zelda thing? And there's like a half dozen people lined up wearing like Zelda shirts. Oh my God. All like middle-aged like parents Heck like yeah, us. yeah, man. And yeah, I was just That's like, love it. we are fitting a profile here, aren't we? You know, I was like, they, they, Nintendo knows their, their audience. So yeah, we went there, we got a um, fanny pack that has the, thing because we were one of the first whatever nice. thing that came with it so we got a zelda fanny pack. fit all your bombs and boomerangs in there that's right and uh rachel and joseph have been living their best life playing tears of the kingdom all weekend yeah i was talking to rachel a little bit about that today because oh, yeah. um, i when I, in that video i was telling you about they were talking mm -hmm. about how it had so much so much building stuff and attaching rockets and things i'm like oh my god that's so not for me but joseph goulet oh, like he's super I, into it i immediately thought i'm like that his, is his, his entire room is lego like, yeah well, all well, and, and minecraft stuff. too like oh, he's yeah. that that's his like jam i, I oh, thought yeah. i thought about him when i was oh, watching yeah. that video i was like this for is gonna sure. be a joseph game and it's like this on the they too like one of them so it's like we you know they have to share it basically because it's like it's really a one player yeah game. as you were saying we might have to buy a second one uh, yeah but we'll see we'll see because <laughs> rachel like that's that's part of what she really enjoys she she games um but you know they did fine with breath of the wild and then um yeah so we bought the hard hard copy so they can share it heck yeah um, that's how you do it that's right if that's you right. can't sell it you don't own it that's right that's very true um but yeah so they've been just enjoying the heck out of that all weekend um, Rad. but me and ellie we've been like Chopping doing down the, trees? Doing the outdoor thing. No, not chopping <laughs> on trees. Not chopping on trees. When are you going to give but... her her first chainsaw? Um, Good question. <laughs> she She's definitely afraid of getting a splinter. So she wants nothing to do with wood, mm. which is unfortunate. That is unfortunate. And Joseph, is he's been more willing, but still, it's mm. like pulling teeth to get. So I'm like, I'm like not trying to force my hobbies onto the kids. Of course not. I'm going to teach them everything I can. But yeah. no, Ellie's really been into like doing outdoor stuff. You know, she like commented to me. She's like... Um, they were, I think I might have talked about this like when I was playing catch with her and like her, did I mention this last week? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like her, their their gym coach like yeah, she's, you plays said catch she, and throws football and stuff like that. You said she threw a pretty yeah, she's impressive like, she's spiral. Like, she's like, all the boys get to play these sports all the time. And yeah. I was like, well, we could throw the football. Like, I'll throw it with you, you know? We've been doing it like every night to the point where I'm like, oh, my shoulder needs a rest because she wants to throw it for like an hour. And I'm like, all right, I'm game. But it's like, it's a lot of throwing. Wow. So yeah, doing football and baseball and all that kind of stuff. And she wanted to like, we tried like pitching and like hitting, which is mostly like missing and then running to go get the ball. So I was like, all right, let's get a, let's get a tee, like a ball tee. And then she can just hit it off the tee and I can throw it back to her, you know, that kind of a thing. So, you know, she was like using her brother's glove, which is kind of big. And I was like, okay, well, if we're going to like stick with this, I'll get her like her own glove and all that. So it's like we did some of that and she's going out there and we're throwing the balls back nice. and forth and doing that kind of stuff. So yeah, so I'm just trying to you know, spend good daddy Very daughter cool. time. So cool. all right, well, kind of the middle school is going to need to start a girls football team now. I know, right? You she's know, a, she got a pretty good arm on her. Or then, then what about like a uh, lacrosse? That's a that's a pretty uh, popular sport. She's she's an interesting one. She doesn't. She's very competitive, but she doesn't want to do like an organized sport. She likes to do things her own way. Oh, and uh, you know, she's she could follow in her dad's footsteps and do uh, shot put. I told her about that. I was like, yeah, why not? Yeah, I did shot put in uh, mostly middle school. I did some in high school, but it got harder because the size of the like in was it in middle school? I think you use an eight pound shot put. In high school, you go to a twelve pound shot put. It's Jeez. a it's a jump. And I was I'm thinking of like a twelve pound bowling ball. Like that that's hefty. Yeah, it's that hefty, but it's in a like a softball size. Still. It's and you're just chucking a jump. I'm like, how far could I throw chunk a chunk of metal? And then the Olympic ball. the Olympic size is sixteen pound. <laughs> shot wood. It's it's big. And I did discus as well, which was a lot of fun. Oh, I don't remember I didn't know you did that. Yeah, I did that. Okay. That was that was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, I know you did shot wood. Yeah. I was really good in middle school because I was very large. I was two hundred and fifteen pounds in eighth grade. And about have, six feet tall. I have no idea how much I weighed yeah. at, at any point in my life. You probably never. You never weighed more than two hundred pounds. Oh God, or even no. close to it. No. Yeah, yeah I'm. I'm. I'm a heftier frame. But you know, so that was great. But then I lost like forty pounds when I got into ninth grade. And you got kicked off the shot put team. They they put you off the kicked, shot. I didn't get kicked off, but I was I was having a substantially harder time. They doing come it. back when you've got the heft yeah. back, man. That's when I went to. I did hurdles. I did pole vault. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's all the, like the weird stuff? that just probably doesn't have as many people competing in it. I might have a chance at some of those. <laughs> Let me try some of those. But then yeah. like, I did pole vault, but they yeah. hadn't they hadn't done it at our high school in like 40 years. <laughs> so so I had all these poles. Flopping around. I was flopping around. We talked about this. That's yes. right. 
I outgrew, I outgrew the pole and they didn't want to buy new ones for my, <laughs> my heavy butt. So I was like, I guess I can't pull about that anymore. I'll do hurdles. Uh, I'll do hurdles. Pull about just... sounds terrifying. It like, is terrifying. I've seen like videos of people breaking their poles. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah. You can't oh. half-heartedly pole vault. You have to like go for <clears throat> it. And it's kind of terrifying and it's hard to like ease into it. You know what I mean? No. You pretty much just have to. Send, I'm, send I'm way too tentative and. I kind of was too. You know, I, I, I sort of did it, but I was like, yeah, you know, I, I couldn't, I would have, well, I don't know. Maybe I wasn't confident that the pole could hold me and that's part of what I didn't do it. But you got to have some guts to do pole vaulting yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was terrifying. Yeah. The Olympic pole vaulters, they go like 18 feet in the air. It's crazy that's how wild. high they get. Anyway. Um, and then we had Mother's Day as well. We did some brunch, cooked Rachel a brunch, had my parents over as well. So Very I did nice. something for my mom too. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> did some gifts. We went to, um, so last year when we did the Mother's Day thing is when I planted a whole bunch of stuff for Rachel and most of it died. So it was like a great Mother's Day. And then like a month later, it was like, well, everything's dead. So that kind of stinks. Some of that stuff has actually come back. I was hey. just, I abandoned it and I was like, all right, it's all gone. We had voles that like ate half the flowers from underground and it was like, forget it. Some of the stuff's actually grown back and we have some lilies that are like blossoming and stuff now. Nice. And I'm like, all right, yeah. surprise lilies. I think, yeah, lilies and tulips always seem to surprise me. They, yeah, they, they, I thought they were all gone. Yeah, they can, hang, they can hang in there. They're pretty resilient. Came around. So what I've learned now is like, okay, flowers in pots, things in pots that I can do. So I got, I uh, went to this, uh, this like lavender like place. Like it's like a local gardening type whatever thing, but they do a lot of lavender. Huh. Um, they have like some lavender fields and stuff like that. Rachel loves lavender. So. I, bought, I bought some lavender recently. Yeah. I've got lavender yeah. in a pot right now. There you go. It so hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't bloomed yet. It's all still all green, yeah, but yeah. yeah. So I got her some lavender. Um, that one we're gonna keep indoors. So I got some, there's 180 species of lavender. Do you know uh, that? That's no. insane. There's so many plants out there. Jeez. It's crazy. So I got her some version of it. Elegance, I think it's called. Oh, it's like does well in a pot. Apparently, All we'll right. see. I'll probably kill it. But I did that. I put it in a pot, and then I got her some a couple of different types of basil and some rosemary and some mint, just nice. like fresh herbs. And I was yeah. like, okay, we can probably manage this. I'm doing those. In a pot. I'm doing those by seed right now in my starters. I'll probably oh. put those. I'm doing you two. I got two planters full of basil, one of rosemary, one of thyme. Okay. I'll probably transplant those into the raised bed mm -hmm. this weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. There you go. Nothing's dead yet. All right. I got a couple carrots that didn't come in. So oh. I've got like, a, I've got a grow bag full of carrots. That's kind of like all the sprouts are there, but it's kind of like a crescent moon where there's one spot that just mm. this didn't take. So I don't know if uh, Weird. those got washed away or I didn't, hmm. you know, I don't know what happened there, but uh, yeah, more or less everything seems to be okay. My, do you remember that? plan i told you that i had to uh scarify the seeds by like cutting up. yeah none of those are happening so i think uh, i might have screwed something up there but i also know that the seeds are very very hard so they do take yeah. a long time to germinate okay. so i'm still holding out a little bit of hope but yeah. also i'm like i ruined them i don't know mm. we'll see did you scarify them too much or not mm, enough maybe i don't know how are you gonna know i don't know it's gonna take you like three or four years to find out oh no they're in a grow bag i don't i don't i don't leave them uh over the winter I mean, like if you if you try again, like next oh, season, right. yeah, you're like, all right, next year I'll scarify them less, and then they won't grow. And you're like, all right, next year I'll do it more. Yeah. Anyway, growing this stuff is hard. It's harder than it is, but it's it also seems. really fulfilling when it works out. I uh, will find that out if and when something actually works. I don't know. I Mine's tell like, you, it's like a surprise. I tell you, tomatoes are easy, man. In our, in We've our... tried tomatoes in the past. We've tried watermelon, other things. Our problem is animals. Animals get freaking everything. Oh, yeah. No matter where we've lived, they've mm. always gotten everything. But I don't really you could, have like you could... fencing and all that kind of stuff either. So it's, with, with, with that sunroom, though, you could probably grow a vegetable in there. In there? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I haven't thought about that. I bet you could. There's a lot of light in there. I don't know. Maybe. Then the animals inside the house would get them being oh. my children. Unless they're apples, I think you're probably safe. Ellie, or she gets dogs. on some vegetables. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hot, grow a hot dog plant. That's like a Frank and Beans plant. You know what you should do? You should do a kumquat, kumquat tree. Kumquat tree. Yeah, though that can definitely survive in your sunroom, and it's a, it can you can keep it kind of small. And the great thing about kumquats is that they I don't remember um, what kumquats are. They're tiny citrus fruits about about the size of a large grape. Okay. Um, and you can eat the whole thing. Huh. With, with the skin and everything. So huh. it, it's got the texture of like a lemon or orange skin. Okay. But you can pop the whole thing. They're very tart. Interesting. Um, they're super fun to grow. And they're nice, bright, beautiful orange little fruits. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Kumquat tree. Yeah, kumquat tree. All right. 
I've wanted to do one too. Um, they work well in our zone, but huh. I'd, I would need to bring it in during the winter. Oh, um, interesting. So, but you wouldn't have to do that. Hmm. All right, I'll look into it. I think it's your responsibility because I can't do one. You have to do one or else it's a direct insult to me. Well, you might be insulted, so. Sorry. Dang it, Brian. I'm not committing to it. I just said that's interesting. Sounded like you committed. Mm, we heard different is a things. Promise, we heard friend. different things. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. That's why that's our go-to phrase. Uh -huh. Our kids ask for something, and it's not really a no, but it sort of is. Oh, of course. It's a will. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm very frank with Archer about that. I don't do the whole we'll see thing. I just tell him like, uh, I'd like to, but I'll probably forget and won't do it. Huh. Or I say, uh, I don't really want to do that. But if I don't have anything else going on, I, I, I will. <laughs> or I'll say, probably not because I don't think you're going to clean your room in enough time for us to do that. Mm. But if you clean your room, then sure. There you go. So I'm always pretty upfront about it. Yeah. With that, but uh, fair enough. There's always a reason for no. A good one. It's always a good reason to say yeah. no to your kids. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fun stuff. I also All bought right, him a, uh, I did buy him a hammock though because I felt so bad. <laughs> um, bought him a, one of those like camping hammocks. One of the, um, yeah. one of the, silky floofy yeah, swishy sure. ones yeah, yeah. Um, that pack up in the little baggy things. I bought him one those of those, uh, hung it from his little jungle gym area. So nice. now he has a inside, non, non uh, the pollen inside. So now he has a non pollen saturated That's fun. hammock. That's cool. So hammocks are cool. Yeah, it was like 20 bucks. No big yeah, deal. Nice. Good stuff. All right. Well, that's all the um, what's happening stuff. We don't really have any company updates this week, so we will go ahead and wrap this sucker up. Uh, we are doing a company. Do we have a company update? What do we we're have? We're doing a, a company we uh, baseball game. Oh, yeah. That's happening. Yeah. As we're publishing this. Yeah. Friday. We're going to a local baseball game. Taking a half a day off. Yeah. Mental hey, health half day. Mental health half day. Yeah. Going to see the uh, Richmond Flying Squirrels. That's right. That's our local team. That's our mascot. Flying is, Squirrels uh, are cool. They're interesting, what, kind of neutral. What sort of like baseball zone is that? There's it's like minor league, minor league. Is that what they call that? I think if there's any more depth to it than that, I'm not I thought aware. it was like triple A, double A, single A. We are out of my depth. I don't know what that means. Out of my depth, I have no idea. Yeah. I think it feed, It used to feed into the Atlanta Braves. I know that. Yeah. I don't know if that's the case anymore. I think it's like one of the bigger minor leagues. No idea. I really don't know. It's a really old stadium, I know that. No, I thought that maybe that I'm thinking college sports. This is not, this is not our expertise, Drew. Why are we even, I don't know. Why are we even trying? I have nothing to draw upon in Neither which to try I. to remember or think of anything. Know. I have no context, but yeah. anyway. That, yeah, but that's a company, sponsor, that. company sponsored yeah. event. It's super that's kind fun. of the Goulets to that's do fun. that. Pay yeah. people to go to Woo. baseballs. Yep. Sports games. Cool. All right. And then let's wrap it up. Well, thank you all for watching. Yes. Please leave us some feedback. Please. Ask us questions. Let us know how we're doing. How? Um, you can check out gulaypens.com. Check it out. For lots of things. Thanks. Pens, ink, and paper mainly. Um, and like and subscribe to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all these things. All right. Fun facts. Pulled a Zelda fact, Drew. Oh. Should have got a bunch of Zelda Zelda, facts. he's that guy with the sword and the shield, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, did you know that Zelda was named after author F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife? I did not. Yep. Author of The Great Gatsby. I was going to ask who, who that is. I know he's famous, but I don't know what he did. Yep. Um, describes Zelda as an artist, writer, and personality who helped to establish the Roaring Twenties image of liberated womanhood and body body flapper. Well, how about that? Yep. Shiguro, Princess Zelda herself Sh is Shiguro, quite a sassy lady. Yep. Shiguro independent. Miyamoto loved the name Zelda. And uh, so there you go. The rest is history. All right. Where did they come up with Link? Link was influenced by a Disney character. It's actually the next fact on this Aha! quick thing that I did. Perfect. Um, let's see here. A Disney the character. protagonist of the Zelda series was inspired by Peter Pan. I can see the similarities. Oh, so not the name. Uh, no. Just the, the, el character. the elvish look. In an interview in 2012, in Shigeru green Miyamoto explained that he was a big fan of Disney mixed with the design. Actually, Nintendo and Disney have a very close relationship. Well, how about which that? if you listen to the podcast that I referred you to. You'll learn all about that. As soon that. as you buy a kumquat tree. Nope. All the way around. <laughs> you listen to the podcast. I'll buy a kumquat I may buy a kumquat tree. That's not what you um, just said. Yeah. There you go. So there's all. Let's see here. Blah, blah, blah. More stuff. Link. Cool. Yep. Leaned on, needed a long hat and pointy ears leaning towards the look of an elf. Yeah. Reminiscent of Peter Pan. There you go. More fun facts. But yeah. Zelda very much on the mind in 
the Goulet household. For and, sure. and across the world. Are you kidding me? It's everywhere. Yeah, I think it's getting pretty pretty good ratings oh, and stuff. Massive. Yeah. Like it's already, I think in, in just three days became like the el- the eighth most popular Zelda game. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it's gonna be the, it's gonna be the most pop most best selling game um, in that series of all time. Here. Surely. Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Let's see if we can find any stats anywhere. Tears of the Kingdom. Best horses and how to upgrade them. Nope, this is not. Nah, this is a bunch of garbage. All right. Anyway, you don't care about any of this. There we go. Have a wonderful week. Bye bye, everybody. Next one. Thank you. Thanks. Right on.